And so, all right, that's what I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, and I don't think we have any additions, but I am hoping to move up item 13, the equity action plan to be right after our board appointments. Um, so that'll be more or less item eight and a half um, is the plan. Uh, any other thoughts or suggestions on that? No, I'm happy with it. Cool, great. All right, so with that, we will consider the uh, agenda approved. And uh, so on to general business and appearances. Um, so this is an opportunity for any member of the public to um, talk about any item that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would identify your name, where you live, and try to keep your comments to about two minutes, uh, that would be great. So um, seems like kind of a small crowd here today, which, you know, is what it is, I guess. But uh, anyway, any any folks would uh, that would like to speak on a topic otherwise not on our agenda? Um, Shana Casper has raised her hand. Okay. Hey, Shana, go ahead. I'm still muted. Yeah, Shana Casper on Kent Street. Um, I'll be speaking in just a moment, but I think uh, first order of business is a big congratulations to Ann Watson on her wedding. <laughs> Ah, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a good day. Beautiful day. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, any other <laughs> comments? <laughs> Can't talk that. <laughs> all right. So we're going to move on then. Um, uh, okay, so uh, on to the consent agenda. So is there a motion regarding, oh, uh, hey, Bill, yeah, go ahead. Oh, and John. Uh, <laughs> so Bill and John. So could you, you can remove the women's suffrage uh, event. They're going to actually be canceling that. That's not happening. We got to, oh. we got to avoid, you know, with Jasmine out, there was a voicemail left on her phone that we just retrieved. Um, so that can be taken off the consent agenda. Okie dokie. And John. The June 12 minutes have vanished. I don't know. Elves got them or something. So they should be taken off the agenda, too. Okay. Uh, Donna. The other change to the minute, you actually attached July 14th, but they're not listed here. I did? July 14th was when we did the rate, the tax rate, and that's the one that showed up twice. The tax yes, yes. no, I know that. I said I didn't send out July 14th with the email I sent out. Uh, it's not, it's list not listed in the agenda. Oh, I got you. I got you. Okay. The agenda only goes till June 24th. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that should be on there too. That's done. <laughs> so removing a couple of items and adding one. Is that what I'm gathering? Removing uh, June uh, 12th and adding July 14th. Okay, and also removing item D. Um, any other comments or questions about the consent agenda? Uh, uh, Lauren, go ahead. Um, I had just noticed I did have um, a June 12th one that, I don't, I don't know if it's the right one or not, but it had me listed as both present and absent. So I think I, if it was the tax rate one, I did miss that one, but just if you're fixing that one, uh, John, for next time. Schrodinger's council member. <laughs> sure, I will admit, I, I sort of cut short my, um, oh, my third pass. I did my second pass, but <laughs> my third pass is where I get the crazy things. So uh, I will fix that. Thanks. So Lauren, you'd be okay with approving that um, if, if you were today, is that, that's correct? Yeah, just yes. listed as absent, not present. Oh, this is absent. It's the June 12th that's going to be removed anyways. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. that was for next time when we see it again. To got you, got you. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Any other comments 
Flower power, suggestions, deletions, additions. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, the motion is second. And just to be clear, it is uh, without item D or the June 12th, or yeah, the June 12th minutes, but adding, um, was it June 14th or? July, July 14th. July 14th. July 14th. Okay, just to be clear. Um, all right, so any uh, further comments? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? And opposed. Okay, great. So, um, uh, so that carries. So, um, we're going to move on. Oh, yes, Bill. Just, I noticed Jeremy Hansen is on the call, and I just want to know that if he's on the call about EC Fiber, I was just letting him know that the council just passed the resolution to withdraw from that, with that vote. Yeah. Great. If he's not, he's not. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay, so we have a few appointments to make. Um, so the way that uh, I think it makes sense to go about this is to uh, have all of the folks who are uh, interested in being appointed uh, introduce themselves uh, for the various uh, boards and committees. And then after we have gone through um, all of those introductions, then we as a council will uh, go into executive session to discuss them and come back. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, the first one, the uh, community fund board. So as I'm getting that one up here, so for that one we have um, looks like we have two seats open, but one um, person having applied. Uh, Amy Cunningham. I do I see Amy. I did I'm not here. see Amy. Oh, you, oh, you're here. Hi. Oh, hello. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Amy Cunningham, a 15 year resident of Montpelier. And uh, this would be my second term on the Montpelier uh, Community Fund Board. Great. Um, does anyone have any questions for Amy? No. Okay, uh, Donna. No question, just to say you've done a great job. So I'm glad you want to come back. Thank you. It's a great group of people. I feel good about the progress we're making. Awesome. Um, okay. And so uh, next is the, um, oh, that's on, uh, Donna, did you have something else you wanted to? I, just, I have one for Bill. This one had people who had terms ending in 2022, 2021, 2020. And I thought we sort of had slots and people took a slot, so they were all ending at, at a more even time. Um, <clears throat> it seemed very strange when these different terms were expiring. This is an administrative question about oh. a committee and their terms. Oh, I see. So you mean the, the actual dates in those years or just the years? Because I think we, we wanted need... to stagger the years so that there was always continuity. Okay, well, when they were, okay, um, they were just that there was only like, there were several that was 22, like half the committee's 22, and only one, a couple 21, and one 20. So I think we should pay attention right, to that. Well, that's that. an administrative question about committees, but it came up on this committee. Okay, thanks. We'll check on that. And the same is true for some of the other committees, so we can just look at all of them. Thank you. Okay, so for the Energy Advisory Committee, we have uh, three spots open and we have one applicant, um, which is Peter Lux. And is Peter on the line? See one phone number there. So uh, Peter, are you there? No, oh, okay. All right, and then the third is the Development Review Board. And for that, there was uh, one uh, vacancy and there were three people applying for it. Uh, Abby White, Jean Leon, and Joshua Kurtlink. And I think I saw Abby. Oh, Abby, um, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Good to see you. My name is Abby White. I am also a 15 year resident of Montpelier and really pleased to be considered for uh, this board. So thank you. 
Any questions for Abby? Nope. Nope, okay. Um, and is uh, Cameron? Um, we got a message from Josh Kirtley, who um, said he does plan on, he did plan on joining, but had an unexpected schedule change with his childcare, so he was unable to make it. So he wanted to send it to college. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and again, um, uh, we have another a number on, so um, it's possible it's Gene. So, uh, Gene, are you on? Okay, not hearing um, anybody speak up there. So, um, at this point, I think we probably should go into executive session. Uh, is there a motion? I'll make a motion that we go into executive session to consider the nominations for the three committee uh, positions. Second. Okay. Um, this is not one of the ones where we have to have two findings, right? Um, right. All right. So, um, so okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so we are, the council is all going to hop off of this call. We're going to join a separate separate call, discuss things, and then we'll be back hopefully in um, a little while. All right, so we'll be back. See you all soon. Um, I'm going to, uh, oh, uh, oh it's, it's, she says it's not letting her in. Hmm. I don't know what that's about. Yeah. Curious. Um, all right, well, is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? All right, so we are back in um, regular session. And now I have a motion that we make the following appointments for the Vermont, Vermont Bayer Community Fund, Amy Cunningham, for the Energy Advisory Committee, Peter Lux, and for the Development Review Board, Abby White. Second. There's a motion and a second. And any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Um, all right, well, uh, congratulations to all. Thank you for your uh, willingness to step up and serve the city. We're so grateful for all of you. And um, uh, one of the things that we considered with the uh, Development Review Board was um, so um, uh, just to provide a little context and background that this well. um, thank you so much Abby um, for stepping up all right so we are gonna um, move on to the um, equity action plan uh, with the social and economic justice committee and for that um, I believe uh, Shana is here um, do you want to talk about this Shana yeah and I believe Michael is on as well Oh, Michael's on as well. I want to come Great. on. On video, Michael. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. We can hear you now. Okay. Perfect. Um, I don't know. Oh, video. I can start the video. Sorry. There. Yeah. There we go. Oh, there's Donna. And Great. Donna's back. You made it. Um, Michael, do you want to start or? No, I think that's fine for you to do that. Okay. <laughs> We didn't we didn't plan this out quite yet. Um, so yeah, uh, Shane Casper Ken Street in Montpelier and um, chaired the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Um, as you know, we got ten thousand dollars from the city to hire um, equity consultants um, on behalf of the city, and um, want to make a proposal to enter into a contracted agreement um, that is with the proposals terms um, that would be with the Creative Discourses. Um, uh, and so wanting to start moving forward with this better um, it, to be able to accomplish our, our goals of conducting an equity assessment for uh, of Montpelier stakeholders to be able to better understand the opportunities and challenges in advancing social justice um, in the city's organizations and the community. And um, this proposal includes uh, 
one hour remote work groups with city officials, formal and informal community leaders, and Montpelier residents writ large. Um, we'll have an online equity survey to assess people's experiences of working and living and playing in Montpelier, interacting with the municipality, um, and gather insights about the experiences of a diverse group of folks who, who live and work and play in Montpelier um, and the impacts of, of local government, um, particularly with regard to underrepresented or marginalized community members. And this contract that we're looking at uh, embarking on is just phase one of a multi-phase, multi-year project that will require continued funding through the city and, and city council. Um, but the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee is also working on a plan to solicit grant funds and donations um, from the larger Montpelier community to continue bolster the work um, provided by creative discourses. So the full proposal is also included in the documentation um, that Cameron sent. And um, we uh, were really excited about this and really hopeful, really hopeful that we can start working on this project um, you know, as soon as possible. Um, anything to add, Michael, or anything, any um, questions from the city? Yeah, you may not notice that what happened in the uh, in the, the change in calendar because of the COVID is yeah. that what we thought we had accomplished in one year can now only be accomplished in the remaining uh, months of the of of the, this fiscal year. So the other th a few parts of it um, have been moved back. We had really moved the calendar around. Um, and the creative discourse people really emphasize the, the importance of spending a lot of time on this first phase, where we will not only be get, gathering information, but we will be making contact in the community. So they were really reluctant to compress the calendar for phase one uh, uh, be, in order to really get a very strong basis for going forward with phases two, three, and four, I guess is the number. Thanks, Michael. Um, any questions for uh, Michael or Shana? Okay, I mean, this seems like a, a great plan and I appreciate that they're taking the time to do some information gathering um, to get to know us and um, yeah, just how, how we can be better. So um, so I, I think what you all are looking for, oh, Jack, go ahead. When we approve the contract as proposed. I'll second um, it. Um, I was going to say, I think it might need to be that we're quite authorizing um, $1,000 to, um, to, anyway, Cameron, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to make a suggested uh, recommended action, if that would be okay. Yeah. Um, so right now what we're doing is um, hopefully authorizing the city manager to accept creative discourses proposal on behalf of the committee and then um, give us permission to enter into a contract agreement that is consistent with those proposal terms. That's yeah, I think that's what I said, wasn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> that's my second too, yes. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, perfect. So, oh dear, I might be frozen. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, all right, so there's a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Hi. Oh no, I keep freezing here. That's not good. <laughs> um, okay, so I like I didn't hear anybody say I just now because it froze. Um, so I'm gonna do it again. Time. Try again. I'm gonna do it one more time for my own sake. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, okay, great. Um, and opposed. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the motion passes. Um, thank you, and um, looking forward to you all getting started with this great work. And I see thank hands you. from Donna and Lauren. Go ahead, Donna. Well, I just want to say what a wonderful proposal and the material you sent us. But also, there's one paragraph that really is really important. I think we have to highlight it for the community that this is about not just racism, but all the perpetual biases sexism, heterosexual, classism, ableism, and, and et cetera. And I really want us to keep that broad focus. So I, I really appreciate the paragraph in here that highlighted that. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. And Lauren. Um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, take a moment to thank the committee who's been working incredibly hard and, you know, it's been a long time of figuring out how to move forward and um, camera as Cameron as staff has done incredible work as well as the um, many volunteers and just reiterate my appreciation to council too and the community for approving this as part of our budget and maintaining it through these really challenging times. Um, but I think this work is going to be really valuable for the community and you know knowing the ongoing conversations we're having about racial and other kinds of social justice I think it's a really timely and, and important conversation so excited to, to move forward and I think this um, the uh, consulting company is going to be great and has been very uh, flexible with you know trying to make this work in a time of COVID when we have to be nimble and maybe do things a little differently and and adjust it so appreciate that as well thanks everyone thank you couldn't have said it better. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Cameron, and thank you to the committee. Same here. Super. Great. Well, we look forward to um, creative dis uh, discourse. Great. Creative discussion. Yes. Yeah, creative discourse. Uh, getting into the work. So, and, and you all as well. So, thank you so much. Um, all right. So, moving on to the next uh, item uh, is the Park Street uh, closure. So, for this, Am I turning it over to Bill or Cameron or um, someone else? Hold on. Hi. Uh, so we have been in discussion with the schools, and I see Andrew uh, LaRosa is on and can probably talk into this, uh, talk about this more, uh, more better than I can. <laughs> but because you may recall two years ago, we closed Park Avenue for a pl the playground, the temporary playground. And the school would like to do something similar to that this year uh, for different reasons. Um, it has to do with the way they have to unload kids from buses and line them up uh, due to COVID and the testing and those, those kinds of things. Um, we're, we're still working out some bus routes, so I think there may be, you know, there still may be stuff to, to, to deal with that. But the, um, as far as the closure itself, I'll, I'll turn it over to Andrew to take it from here. So Andrew, it looks like, uh, so we're not able to hear you right now. It doesn't look like you're muted um, on Zoom. Right now. Yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah I gotta go through my phone. Um, yeah, as part of the AOE's reopening guidelines, we have to pre-screen all the kids before they enter into the building. So, and that combined with the pod model that we're using at, at Union um, of being able to track kids and their interactions with each other. We need to, um, before the kids enter, enter onto the site, we're going to take their temperature. They're going to go straight to their uh, teacher or pod teacher. Um, from there, they'll be escorted into the building and into their classrooms. So we have to stage 450 kids uh, safely outside, and we just don't have the space anywhere other than, than Park Avenue to do that. Uh, we'll be staggering um, the bussers and the walkers, so they'll actually probably end up going inside of two groups, but uh, they, it's probably, there's probably going to be some overlap. So yeah, we just we need the space to do it safely. And then um, same thing with release times. We aren't going to just fling open the doors and, and send people out. We're going to be releasing walkers. We're going to be releasing specific kids when it, they if they're getting picked up by a car they'll we'll be releasing them specifically and also for buses we need to queue everyone up and get them back onto the the bus that they came from um, so it's just a matter of space uh, Connor yeah, no, uh, yeah makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, school to school, are we pretty much having the same protocol? Uh, do we have enough space for Main Street Middle School? I was thinking that, that might be a bit tight as well. Well, Main Street's a little bit different in that the kids are obviously older, so they can we can kind of tell them where they need to go. We're going to be entering into Main Street on either five or six different entrances, so they'll be spread out a little bit more. UBS, we're going to go through two, and it, it's more the control piece of that, the older kids. Uh, we can kind of tell them where to go, and they'll get they'll get there. Uh, and the high school is a different scenario in that 
Um, half the students will be going in a morning session, half will be going in the afternoon, and they'll be entering in through two entrances. Um, so that one's going to be, um, again, they'll pass, that'll be much easier to control. Uh, Jack. Hi, Andrew. A couple of years ago, when we did the, uh, the playground project, there was a lot of outreach and communication with the, with the neighbors who would be affected. And I think that that was part of the, one of the keys to the success. And I wonder if you could update us on how things are going in that area. Yeah. Yeah. We've, uh, we've been in touch with, uh, with John, the neighbor directly across the street. Um, he understands the need. We're going to uh, work with his tenants to make sure that they have off street parking in the winter time. And, and just like we did last time, as well as the other neighbors up on park Avenue, uh, we actually, Bill and I, were contacted by them this afternoon or was it maybe it was yesterday but we've we've talked about some of the issues that we had last time and we'll, we all agree that we learned a lot we'll just be a little more proactive on this but um they're all i don't want to say i don't want to say they say they're supportive but they they're not here saying that they don't want it to happen so i, I would i think they are supportive of, of and understand let's we'll go with understanding of the need and you you told them that this is going to be on the agenda tonight so that yep. they knew to be here if they wanted to be. Okay. Yeah. And we've talked to them about, um, you know, last time we provided a couple of parking spaces on Loomis for the resident that was blocked. And we said we would do that again. So they, they understand that. One thing I think, Andrew, it's clearer now. I know, and I was out last week, so I know you've had some conversations. At one point, it wasn't clear whether this was going to be all the time or just sometime. And I think you now at all the time. The our expectation as a school district, school district, is that the guidelines by the AOE that have been put in place will be for the whole school year. Now that may change, but right, but, but we're we're anticipating we need that pre-screening. The whole year. The closures will include nights and weekends. Is what it was meant. Yeah, yeah, just for safety. Every time we talked with Bob and, and and the police chiefs, just sort of getting people in the habit of knowing that the that road is closed versus oh, I think it's open, I think it's closed. Um, closing it just seems safer. Just gets people in the habit of not making that turn. And we'll yeah. do like we did last year. We'll have a custodian or a teacher park their car uh, in front of the barricades. Um, during school hours so there's just a little extra buffer there now the other question i had and again i apologize i know we should have covered this you would have covered this last friday but i wasn't there on our normal weekly call um you're not doing the buses up on harvard street this year right you're, they're all dropping right as i understand it i know libby has has uh it's uh libby and stacy with the bus company is are deep in the throes of figuring the bus routes out but as i understand it we're going to be the guidance prior to this was prior to the latest guidance, and I'll have to go back and look at what they changed for the buses. But basically, you were assigned a seat, you got on that seat, and then in, at night, in the afternoon, when you got back on the bus, you went in reverse order. So nobody has to like walk by somebody sitting in a seat. So with that all in mind, the idea is that we bring a bus on Loomis, park it, kids get out, that bus leaves. A few minutes later, the next bus comes, and we'll reload that same way. So that's what I short answer. Short answer is no. We're not going to put the buses up on covered again. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Dan. Yeah, a couple questions. Um, the fencing material is this going to be similar to the Park Street closure before, where there was permanent posts, or are we talking more barricades? More barricades. We're we're using a, a similar style that was put out on Langdon Street for a couple reasons. Um, we get to reuse them again, and we actually talked about the city about maybe, you know, being able to share them. We get to reuse them again. Um, they're about the same price as putting in a, a, a chain link fence. And when it came to plowing and things like that, um, having it just gives us more flexibility. You know, we don't know how this is going to evolve, so it will it will be movable barricades, but similar to the ones that are down on Langdon Street. And will it be fenced in totally like it was before, where you create that sort of enclosure, or are you just barricading this? Okay, so it yeah, it'll go down. It'll go down the sidewalk. Okay. Um, 
and along the lines of, of some of the neighbor concerns, and you may or may not be able to answer this, and some of this may go to the city and to Donna, um, but I, I received you know questions from some of the neighbors about clearing the sidewalks with the plow, and presumably with these new barricades, that will make that process easier, um, and that the plowed street snow and sidewalk um, isn't, isn't piled up in front of houses or drives. Um, and is, so I, has, have you addressed those issues with the, the neighbors? Yeah, Bill and I, it's Jeff, correct? That's, that's the neighbor up the street. Yeah, that was one of the specific concerns, um, was that snowbank. And really what it was last year was we, we ended up plowing, we dumped it up at the top and it was a matter we, we got so much snow last year that everybody kind of got behind. So what we'll do is we'll just make sure that this year uh, we don't get behind um, and we make sure that there's an easy drive out of there. Um, so that's, that's one of, that was a concern and we will, we're, we're aware of it and, and we'll be ahead of it this year. And, and this question, the, the last question I think is maybe more for Bill or Donna is um, with the, with Hubbard street, you know, the, 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 is that on the agenda? to be um, repaved or reworked, especially the stretch from Liberty Street to uh, to Park Street seems to have really taken a couple of hits. Um, and if there's more traffic as a result of this closure, um, is, is there, has there been any thought to maybe doing some emergency, at least some emergency patching to help with this traffic flow? All right. I'll let DPW answer this one. Thanks. We're sharing a computer here, so apologies for that. We've had technical difficulties with that from my computer. Um, so yes, we can do some patching um, that can um, ameliorate some of the concerns. Um, or not, we don't have a plan to do much more than that at this point. We can certainly engage in discussions. We want to create a safe situation but right now patching would be what we would be looking to do okay um and and maybe along those those lines actually um I'm sorry to ask one more question but um has there been any thought to maybe removing the on-street parking along that corridor of hubbard street because i know when people are travel when people park on on the side of hubbard street it really narrows that road and it becomes impassable as a two-way street, particularly in winter, but, but certainly in the, even in summer and fall. Um, and if this is gonna be a high traffic area, again, because of the, the, the blockage of Park Street, is, would that be on your radar? Well, I, so Dan, I'll jump in here, you know, um, and that also you know, could be the purview of the city council if you think that's something we, you know, we lived with that last time. Uh, obviously, there were barricades up in the morning and the afternoon, but people could then park there during the day, as I recall. It wasn't no parking. Uh, well, this would be this would be on Hubbard Street, not necessarily on Park. Yeah. Okay. So, so the way it worked two years ago is that school staff went out and put barricades oh, right, in right. That's during, right. Uh, during the actual bus time, but the rest of the time it was open to the public. It wasn't closed all the time. Uh, you know, I think the, the counter to that is when you close Park Ave, there's a whole bunch of parking that right. uh, teachers and school staff and parents and everybody use, and it's already a really tight situation for the neighbors and everybody else there. So, you know, we certainly could block off even one side of, of parking, and I, you know, I've been through there myself. You're right, it becomes one way, and you have to kind of work your way through. Uh, I think the, the, usually for us, the biggest criteria is whether we can get an emergency vehicle through that would really prompt us to um, at least for us to propose action and I don't think we've experienced that but we can take a look at that we can talk to our team okay I, yeah I'll let, I'll let someone else I, I just want to support Dan that that condition of the road no matter what's happening um, with our dad, Donna if you can I think I might be frozen go ahead Donna yeah that part of Hubbard Street, no matter what's going on at Park Ave, is just in terrible condition. It's big holes that grab your tires. And so when you have just those four or five cars parked there, 
it's really bad year round, let alone when snow builds up. I really think we ought to look at it for everybody's safety as well as emergency vehicles. But a fire truck's not going to fall in that hole like my car will fall in that hole. <laughs> Thank Does you. this sound like the kind of thing um, Donna or um, Bill or someone that, that we can like, look into and follow up on? Okay. Definitely. Okay, super. Um, any other questions or comments on this application? Okay. Um, it... oh, I, I was just going to um, to say that, you know, I think getting all of these logistics right for the neighbors and for the parking, um, but certainly the, you know, the space that we need for our kids. I know our school administrators, like, are in this impossible situation right now trying to figure out how to make school work. Um, so just appreciate the school administration and uh, the work that's going into trying to keep our kids safe, you know, having two kids who are going to be going there, um, you know, knowing that they have the space they need to get the distance and um, have the screenings and all that. So I'm, I'm glad to see that, you know, we're trying to trying to make it work and, you know, make sure that we can get the logistics work for the neighbors and everyone as well. But I uh, just wanted to add that in. Um, Jay, was that a hand? Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, just quickly to add too that because the buses are not doing the one one of the main um, things that we did when we set up the program two years ago with the playground was did the bus drop off and pick up up on Hubbard um, past um, uh, you know up above the playground and so because we don't have to do that now there's still that parking available which I think is, you know, which, which is a, which is a big difference relative to what we're talking about now where this, where the buses will drop off closer to the school um, in the staggered, um, staggered way. So I think that that, you know, helps the process um, and it is not as much of an impediment to the, to the neighbors um, for the school year. Cool. Yeah. And just to um, be, Oh, good, Dan. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just to be clear, you know, my concern about the parking is really from Liberty Street to Park Street. That's where it really bottlenecks. the The segment of Hubbard from Park to State Street, I think, is more much more manageable. Um, generally, it, it's a little bit wider. It just seems to bottleneck at that at that uh, first segment. Um, and I think, but I'm perfectly satisfied. I, I, I like the idea that, you know, we revisit it and just look into it. I don't want to necessarily start eliminating parking spaces if we don't have to. Um, but it certainly is something that I think we should be keeping on our radar because I think it is the one sort of weak, weak link here as far as traffic flow. Or one okay. Of them. So, uh, is there um, a motion? Uh, go ahead, uh, Jack. Move that we approve the plan. Second. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Um, further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so we have approved the uh, closure of Park Street uh, plan. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for coming to uh, tell us about this and, and help us understand it. So great. Thanks. Hopefully we have a safe school year. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got the best superintendent, superintendent in the state right now working for you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's encouraging. Thanks. Um, all right. So we're going to move on to... Um, the stormwater master plan. And so for this, I am sort of assuming I'm turning it over to Zach or Donna. And Kurt. And Kurt. So okay. yes, the three of us okay. are going to present oh, um, different aspects of the stormwater update. Um, so I just want to um, sort of recap that we provided in the packet an updated me memo so that a lot of the details you were able to look at and read prior to the conversation tonight. 
Um, the last time we provided an update was in February of 2018. And um, I'll start off with some general information and then um, the majority of the details, which I haven't been here for, will be um, presented by my two colleagues. Um, and then we'll take questions. Um, so in terms of the stormwater overview, um, we have a list of, um, and Cameron, do you have the? Um, yes, I will share your presentation right now. Thank you so much. Can you see it? Yes, I can see okay, it. Great. Hopefully everybody else is, no, can. Um, so in the stormwater update, um, the overview is that um, we have a variety of components um, that are in play here. The stormwater master plan, which was last provided in February 2018, the municipal roads general permit um, initially applied for coverage in 2018. The roof drain study, which was completed um, last year, development of a long-term control plan, that's the draft is completed. There's more work to be done on that. And uh, the stormwater steady state plan is the only part of the system um, that I've mentioned that is not included in the master plan. Um, we are also partnering on the completion of work for these, um, for the plan. Um, we work directly with the uh, Friends of the Winooski, um, which has been a real positive experience for us. Um, they have expertise, as you probably know, in project development, grant writing, and they administratively support the city. They've served as a conduit in a number of instances for accessing funding, which has been critical since um, the stormwater program in general is not currently been funded. Um, in our annual plan. Um, and um, we've also worked with the Regional Planning Commission on a variety of initiatives. So collectively, we're making progress. Um, and I'm going to turn this over at this point to Zach. All right, so first of all, I'm going to start off with uh, just a, a broad definition of what the stormwater master plan is. And it is a, it's an overview of both existing and future considerations of anticipated development with an opportunity to identify stormwater treatment and mitigation projects and efforts uh, that will have the highest uh, re return on investment. The, the goal of this document is to support the city in improving stormwater management management by providing a list of high priority uh, water resource concerns and identifying some conceptual solutions that will support development and implementation in the future um, in a targeted manner. Um, some of the other components that were identified in the master plan include a review of our best management, management practices for street sweeping uh, and catch basin cleaning. Uh, a prioritized list of problem areas, uh, highlight opportunities to implement treatment in combined sewer overflow areas, present some conceptual ideas for the high priority areas that were identified, and review the available funding sources that were currently, uh, that were in 2018 when the master plan was uh, drafted. Next slide, camera. So in 2018, we provided uh, a very similar list to what is here. And everything that you see in green, highlighted in green, is a change in status from 2018 to 2020. Uh, so we just recently implemented CSO monitoring systems in all of our overflow structures, uh, which is gonna be great because it's gonna provide us with a lot of data uh, that we haven't had. Um, so it'll help us target areas for a reduction in CSO volumes, um, so that was just implemented in the past, about a month ago. Um, we're still in the uh, confirmation and configuration phase uh, with our uh, consultant at this time. Um, as we mentioned before, we 
since completed the, the roof drain separation study. Um, and then there are a few projects where we have actually implemented, implemented some treatment, uh, Old Country Club Road along the bike path, the new bike path, uh, the BSECU parking lot uh, that you've probably all seen on a little stormwater uh, treatment area. Um, the UES uh, uh, did some stormwater treatment as well when they redid their playground. Uh, we finished the design of the Hubbard Park um, system, and now we're, we have actually received a grant for that project. Um, we had hoped to get into construction uh, this summer, but um, due to COVID, it's kind of slowed things down there. Um, so we're going to, we are hopeful that we'll be able to get an extension um, so that we can construct that hopefully next year. Uh, Chestnut Hill uh, was the design had been completed. We have received some uh, grant funding to do a portion of that project. And lastly is the Taylor Street brick arch lining and stormwater treatment uh, that is currently being done as we speak. All right, so this slide, oh, a little feedback there. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, this slide is really a bad Wait one second. Technical difficulties here. All right, let's try that again. Um, so this slide is really meant to illustrate sort of the different projects that come up um, related to stormwater quality. There's always a surprise, you know, there's always a new issue. So, you know, the document really has to be uh, fluid and being, and the public works department really has to be able to adapt to new, new issues that come up. I'm not gonna go through all these projects, but, um, you know, some the, the ones that are really uh, most aligned with the stormwater master plan is uh, the items that involve actually um, treating stormwater. So that would be the Taylor Street reconstruction, which is active right now. There's um, forest pavements, infiltration chambers that actually clean the stormwater. Also, one Taylor had uh, similar features and um, Wheelock Street was identified in the plan as uh, a potential um, stormwater quality treatment system. But there's other projects on here that are related to uh, reducing CSOs um, uh, and also uh, erosion issues that come up. You know, um, you might have an outfall that's fine for many years and then you get one big storm and um, it starts to unravel and that has to become a priority for public work. So um, it's just kind of to indicate or illustrate that uh, it's always changing, it's always adapting and um, new projects are always coming up that we have to address. Next slide, Cameron. Okay. Next, I want to talk about uh, the municipal roads general permit, uh, which was we first applied for coverage in 2018. Uh, when the stormwater master plan was developed, we knew that we were going to be required uh, to uh, under a permit, but at the time, we didn't know what that was going to look like. Um, we have since um, we have since been under since 2018 we have been under coverage and now we've been working on uh, the projects that are that were identified through uh, this permit. So there was an inventory that was completed in addition to um, applying for coverage and not all of the the projects that are required um, for us to under the MRGP uh, program are identified in the stormwater master plan. So we wanted to take this time to talk about both components because they're both um, important to stormwater quality. Um, this permit was required by Act 64 and it requires the it requires all municipalities uh, to bring non-compliant uh, hydraulically connected roads and outfalls uh, to standards by December 31. Uh, 2036. Um, all right, next slide. All right, so um, roof drains are, um, you know, a lot of them are connected directly to the sewer system. 
and um, so they contribute to uh, combined sewer overflows, which is obviously a water quality concern. We, um, two years ago, we got a, a 50,000 grant through the Lake Champlain Basin Program to update our roof drain study. Was, there was one originally prepared in 1995. And um, really the, the report looked um, kind of uh, in depth at the commercial, the large buildings with a fairly large contributing area of stormwater to the sewer. And um, just kind of, um, a, a rough uh, uh, layout of some options for residential treatment. So um, through this grant, uh, we updated uh, all the commercial buildings and um, the schools uh, where they're at, um, looked at whether it would require internal or external work to separate them from the sewer system. And uh, it ties into the long-term control plan that Zach mentioned for eliminating CSOs. Um, we were also able to purchase a smoke testing machine through this grant, which is a great tool for uh, identifying these issues. Um, <clears throat> and sort of the last piece that we have to wrap up with this is to propose some ordinance. Uh, resolving these issues will require going on to or working with private properties. And um, now we're, already, we're working on an update to the sewer ordinance now already. There's um, some updates that need to be done for, for um, Managing, managing grease in the sewer system as well. So we will come back um, at some point to council and, um, and have some language uh, for your consideration to uh, include roof drain separation work. And um, tying in with that related to the, to the roof drain connections is uh, a long-term control plan. So, um, this is a requirement of our wastewater plant discharge permit is to develop a plan to effectively eliminate um, uh, CSO overflow events. And that's going to require um, a variety of different things. Um, the roof drain separation work is, is a component of it. There's also some street separation. There's uh, infiltration. There's capacity issues with our collection system and the siphons. Um, that trans transfer the, um, the wastewater across the rivers. Um, and we just wanted to mention this as, again, it's all tied into water quality. It's not, it's, uh, CSOs are mentioned in the stormwater master plan, but um, just very briefly. And it is, uh, you know, we feel a very important consideration if, as you look at overall uh, water quality for, for Montpelier. Um, so we have completed the draft of the long-term control plan. Uh, the state has uh, provided comments back and we're currently updating um, the plan based on those comments. And really what this plan does is sort of um, give us a roadmap. We've identified funding based on uh, the sewer master plan for projects that need to be done in order to eliminate CSOs. It is gonna take some time, but um, uh, just recently we were able to get the, um, the automatic um, monitor systems in, which allows us to see uh, on our computer when an overflow happens, uh, the volume that actually discharges and where that um, water is coming from if there's multiple pipes uh, entering the structure. So it's a great first step. And, um, and I think, you know, like I said, this is a very important piece of the overall water quality picture. So just wanted to bring that into the discussion here. Yep. All right, this, oops, okay. Um, so this graphic here is um, the second to the last of our um, graphic presentations and it's placed here so that um, it identifies the collective um, efforts that are ongoing that we've been talking about and it's an opportunity for questions and answers before Zach concludes the presentation on what's to next. So if any of you have questions directly related to what's been presented or to the memo, um, we're happy to answer questions now. And on this, uh, on this chart here, the stuff in green uh, show, indicates that it is uh, a regulatory requirement. Um, so we have both the uh, permit requirements for MRGP and the long-term control plan. Um, great, so is, am I to understand that that's, that you all are, are done with your presentation then? And which is okay? 
We have one more slide. We can just do we have that. one more slide. Okay, sorry. Please so can. what's next for us is that in the fall, we need to provide a, a draft update to the state of Vermont um, of our long-term control plan. So we are currently going through those edits now. Uh, we have an intern working for us, and she's actually been able to go through and address uh, a lot of the stuff that has already been indicate, uh, identified within the long-term control plan and the draft plan. And the next step is to finish up our, our draft and get it back to the state for review. In addition to that, by the end of 2020, under our municipal roads general permit, we have to have a stormwater management plan in order to be in compliance. Uh, so we will be we will be giving this. Um, it actually goes to regional planning, who submits it on our behalf to the state of Vermont. Um, so that'll be due by the end of uh, 2020. And then uh, the other component is. Uh, development of a stormwater steady state master plan, which is we have these master plans for sewer and we have them for water, and um, we feel that we need to develop the same thing with for stormwater so that we can tackle both the failing infrastructure and the treatment in a in a combined effort. Now, is there any questions? Okay, um, any uh, questions for uh, this crew? I, I have lots of questions and some ideas and comments, but uh, I'm going to save them for now. Um, I, is that a hand from Lauren? Uh, yeah, I had a couple quick questions. Um, one, I was just curious when you mentioned that your part of what you're working on for the CSOs is a um, proposed policy. I was just curious what the timeline of um, when we might see a proposal on that. Yeah. So I think you're mentioning the, the roof drain um, separation policy. Is that what you're referring to? The ordinance update for the roof drain connections? That, that might have been. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it might have been part of that. I just thought that there was a tie to the CSO policy proposal. Okay. Just curious yeah. when that would be coming back to us potentially. Is that the long-term control plan, Herb? Um, yeah, <laughs> Somebody want to tell him that we can't hear him? That we can't hear you. Okay, try that again. Um, so the, the long-term control plan is um, it's it's a document that's submitted uh, to the state as far as like our roadmap to eliminating CSOs. Um, it's it's not it's and it's tied to the uh, funding levels we have in the sewer master plan, and um, so as far as approval by. Um, Council, I mean, uh, I don't know. It has to be approved by the state, but it's. Um, I was more referring to coming to council about um, the roof train separation ordinance to approve some. Yeah, changes. that's what I was wondering about the timing of. Okay, I would say this winter, um, sometime. I would I'd like to present that to council cool. after construction season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, just a couple more quick ones. Um, do you know yet? Um, how the impending three acre um, general permit might impact like priorities or what that might change um, for what the city's going to have to do in the coming years. And I mean, I know the timeline on that is pretty long, but uh, my understanding is that it's kind of ready to go and could come out soon. Um, so just curious what, what that might do to change priorities or bump things up the list. Right. Um... Yeah, the city doesn't have a lot of uh, large um, properties contiguous, cemetery. right? This the cemetery is probably um, one, maybe Hover Park that could be impacted by that. I, I don't see a large impact from that rule for the city because there's not um, a lot of impervious areas associated with them. Um, but something we'll definitely have to address as it comes up. Great. Um, just curious too, how much in the um, 
in the plan is, you know, I assume it's all at this point, like climate resilience is, is built into, you know, whatever standards we're, we're looking at. Just curious how much the, you know, knowing that the, the world is changing and, and standards is that baked in at this point? Is there still work to do um, on ensuring that, you know, infrastructure investments we're making are going to be resilient to the, the future that Right. So, uh, you know, almost everything is is underground. So there, uh, you have some protection from um, elements there. And you know, the goal of most of the infrastructure work is to in increase capacity. You know, the the that's really our um, restricting factors. The, the wastewater plant can treat a lot more water uh, than we can get to it. Um, so it's it's. And our really our approach is to preserve infrastructure while at the same time increasing capacity. So things like uh, lining the concrete pipes uh, with either epoxy or, or plastic, to, which will reduce the friction, get it there faster, but also preserve the asset. So you're sort of getting two benefits out of the investment. Um, so that's really the primary approach to how we uh, went about the long-term control plan is, um, is in, in increased capacity while preserving the asset. Um, did I see a hand from Dan at one point? Um, you may have, but I'm, I, I do actually have a question, so I'm happy to. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I had one specific question. It just caught my eye in reviewing the slides. Uh, where you talk about the road diet. Um, what does that mean? So uh, there's a, for example, on uh, Greenfield, Deerfield, we had a road that was like 36 to 38 feet in width. Mm -hmm. So when we reclaimed it and redid the road, you shrink up the amount of impervious area, which is a really good benefit for stormwater quality because you allow the water to get off the road and get and start absorbing through the natural features, uh, like such as grass or swales or trees, rain gardens. Um, right. When we say road diet, that's what we're meaning. Uh, so if you have, you know, a 10% reduction in impervious area, uh, there's other communities that have utilities that they get credits for those type of actions. Um, so it's something that we don't necessarily have a, a credit or get any um, acknowledgement for, but we still consistently when we can try to shrink up the roads. It also helps with um, traffic coming. And so it doesn't have anything to do with the, the salt or sand mixture that you pour on the roads or the type of asphalt that you use. No. Okay. Um, and I guess the, I had a sort of overarching question is, um, you know, what are the biggest impediments to implementing the next phases in the stormwater uh, master plan? Is, is it money or is it uh, sort of time and resources? It's a little bit of both. So we have, um, that's kind of why we wanted to talk about the stormwater master plan, the long-term control plan, the roof drain study. We have some kind of competing uh, areas with that are really all using the same funds. Um, so, you know, we've talked about developing a stormwater utility so that we can address all components of it. Um, that's right now we're kind of, you know, we're, we're lacking funding and resources to really capture all sides of, of the picture. And, and when you say develop a stormwater utility, do you mean sort of a utility district that deals strictly with st stormwater that has its own budget or, I'm sorry. I'm... It's like an enterprise fund that okay. um, is related specifically to stormwater improvements and uh, other areas that have been successful in implementing that. I think there's five in all of the state of Vermont. Um, they put a portion towards uh, infrastructure, put a a portion towards public outreach, put a portion towards um, stormwater treatment. Uh, so it's a way that they can kind of hit each piece. So I'm, I'm going to jump in here because I just want to clarify that. So you're picturing a potential stormwater utility as being a part of the long-term control plan? Not, not completely. Um, they're kind of two things that uh, go together, but uh, not really in within the, the long-term control plan. Okay, so, well, I want to talk more about that, but I realize I'm interrupting Dan. So, if there's anything more you you had there, Dan? 
No, okay. Um, Donna. Uh, yes, it was about the, the road diet. Now, is that going to be, I mean, many of you will know the Berlin Barry Montpelier Road, that was the road diet of reducing the car lanes. But in the complete streets that we've adopted, part of the road diet in neighborhoods of the streets you listed that don't have sidewalks would be to make sure there's some space created to be shared for walkers and bikers. Is that part of your plan? So we do consider that, and that's why we work with Corey pretty closely to make sure that when we want to narrow a street down, uh, that it's not counter, um, it's not going against initiatives that are in the bike ped master plan. So we kind of work together um, in areas to make sure that if it's identified in a different plan or a different document that we're not just reducing for stormwater purposes, but we're, we're trying to be cognizant of, of all of the considerations. Right, because there's road diets to reduce the car lane, but to have space for other modes. Okay, please keep that in mind. <laughs> we do, okay. and that's, I work really closely with Corey to make sure that Good. we're not. Thank you, all the information provided tonight is very, very helpful, thank you. That's a great question, Don, and I think that's something for the council to keep in mind is that sometimes we have um, goals, important goals and priorities that in some ways conflict with one another. And, you know, um, and this is, we've used this example in the past that, you know, one of the best ways to deal with, with um, stormwater is to have more, you know, less impervious surface. So you narrow the roads, have more dirt and drainage and those kind of things. But at the same time, we have a policy of wanting more bike lanes and more sidewalks, which really would call for widening and creating more spaces. So while they're both great things to have, um, you know, I think we need to, you know, uh, DPW is doing it right, but I think it's just important for the council to remember that they can be at odds with one another, even though they're both good. So, you know, we kind of have to pick and choose. This is a road that we're going to opt to keep the bike and ped lanes on. This one, maybe not so we can get more you know better storm runoff. and northfield street is a is a really good example of that we wanted to put in uh the uphill bike lane but what that meant is that it triggered us to do some stormwater treatment with that project so because we wanted to do the initiative and have that uphill bike lane on northfield street we created more impervious area which then triggered us to do some treatment of the stormwater so would this be a decision in the future of these streets done by staff or do, are they going to come back to the CIP and then the council? Uh, typically we use our, our planning documents to guide us. Um, so Corey works closely with you about priorities uh, within the bike pad master plan. So we use those documents to help really prioritize uh, how to, what we need to do. Um, if there was something controversial, I'm guessing we would come back and ask for a recommendation. Um, but the ones that we've come across so far have been pretty straightforward. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I may jump in here with some questions, unless other folks have some questions they want to ask. Um, so I dug up the uh, 2016 uh, Stormwater Master Plan uh, just to, you know, look at the things that were uh, listed there, because as I had recalled, um, it seemed like, that, I mean, there was this incredible list of things to do. And I, I just want to say, like, just looking at the list of things you all have accomplished in the last four years, it is awesome. Um, there's, um, it's an impressive amount of work for, uh, for even just four years. So um, thank you. Awesome. Keep up the great work. It's um uh, it's really encouraging. Um, you know, looking at the old stormwater master plan, there were some projects that were not addressed in this, and I think that's because they were private. Um, and I, so it makes sense that, like, it's not, it's not in our purview to make those kinds of projects happen. Uh, but I just want to um, note them. You know, I mean, some of the problem areas that were um, discussed in that 2016 plan were the, the Jacobs parking lot sort of, uh, like, behind... Um, I guess it's now rabble rouser. So um, like behind there or um, the parking lot at Shaw's um, also like behind uh, the Coulter's garden on the Barry Montpelier road. Um, all of these were private um, properties that 
need, you know, that need addressing. Um, and I, I'm just, so just before I, I jump in, I'm guessing you all, I don't know, like, I don't think we would have necessarily um, kept track of whether or not work had been done there, but do you, do you happen to know with like those three sites, for example, if work has been done? No, no work has been done on, on those sites uh, in specific. I think a lot of the of our approach was doing some of the, the easiest stuff first, you know, a lot of the stuff that was in, uh, that was public that we could easily tackle. Um, and then we also partnered with uh, the friends of Winooski who helped do the, the credit union project. Right. Um, so we really rely on those partnerships to help get some of these, these private projects done. Um, but there's also the funding issue um, that we don't really have funding for them. So, you know, when we did, when we repaved College Street at the time, we had applied for a grant to do swales. Well, we were already in motion to pave it and we didn't get the grant. So it, you know, it, it kind of is what it is at that point. I mean, we had to pave it, we had to improve the street, um, but we missed the, the, we didn't get, it didn't get funded. So. Um, that's why we are bringing up, you know, kind of the competing issues in the funding discussion, because if we don't get grants, then it sometimes, it prevents us from being able to tackle some of these things that were identified. And so funding right now for these kinds of projects, if we don't get grants for them, um, would they be paid from like the side charge? Can you, you cut out for a second there? Oh, okay. Um, so if, let's say we didn't uh, get grant funding for something, um, I mean, we have this uh, like water sewer benefit charge. Uh, does that go help to pay for um, some stormwater improvements? Not at this time. And if you were to develop a utility, you could consider reallocating some of that, but that's, um, that would also have to be approved and better. Because we do use some of the CSO benefit charge to pay for stormwater maintenance work. And we have used some of that, but not the full capital projects. Okay. So, I, I mean, I so I'm I'm very interested in the long term steady state plan for stormwater, uh, but that does raise this issue of how is it going to be paid for? And one of the options there is a stormwater utility. And just thinking about the the water sewer benefit charge, you know, if, if that has gone for you know maintenance of the stormwater system in the past, um, it seems to me that we should think about who is paying into that and is that the right amount? Uh, because some players in the city are are bigger contributors uh, to the stormwater uh, than others, and. Uh, I mean, and you could look at this from both uh, a water quality perspective, as well as uh, a risk for erosion, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, and right now the, the water sewer benefit charge is based on um, property value, right? But I, I, I think about, you know, Shaw's, for example, maybe they don't have a proportionally speaking very expensive bill. Uh, but they have an incredible amount of asphalt. And so um, theoretically, I would suppose that um, someone with a lot of asphalt like that ought to be paying more into um, some fund that's going to go towards remediating um, you know, water quality and, and erosion. And I um, also, just for context, I, um, even just this week, was approached by a homeowner who said, you know, there's this creek behind my house and it is eroding uh, my property and um, I don't, I don't have funds to, uh, to correct it. I don't like, I, um, anyway, so just thinking about uh, how are private uh, folks paying for um, water issues, um, particularly in regards to erosion um, that we anticipate are going to get worse because of climate change. Um, so, uh, it would be great. Uh, I would love for there to be a, uh, a funding mechanism that both, um, went to help with the maintenance of the, the system and got us up to where it needs to be. Um, so just, uh, all that is to say is something that would fund the long-term, um, plan. But in addition to that might, uh, provide some kind of grant opportunities for, uh, private, uh, citizens that, 
ideally would be self-defeating, right? Because let's say, um, you know, a place that has a lot of asphalt, uh, like VSUCU, puts in a, uh, a swale uh, or rain garden, uh, that that would then, you know, help uh, reduce their uh, contribution to, uh, to, let's say, a, a stormwater utility. Um, so this is something I've been um, talking about for a while. Um, and even just knowing that you all are like open to that idea, uh, I think is, is really helpful and interesting. And I think if we were to go down that road, um, it could potentially reconfigure the water sewer benefit um, charge. So um, I just want to put it out there. Oh, uh, <laughs> hang on one second, Lauren. Um, I just want to put it out there that this is something that I am very interested in and would love to uh, dig into with a small group of folks if if others are interested, um, you know, focusing on uh, who's paying for stormwater uh, management now and who should be and how do we configure that. Um, just want to put that out there. It's like basically as a, a stormwater uh, funding study group. Um, and uh, yeah, it, I'm not sure if uh, uh, I want to do, like ask right now, like anybody else interested, um, but um, okay, so there, okay. So just did, um, and then maybe we can see if there's other um, member public. Uh, maybe there's other members of the public who might be interested as well. Fabulous, great um, little little stormwater working group. Um, I'm very interested in it as well. I've uh, cool. attended quite a few uh, conferences and seminars about the creation of a utility and what other communities are doing. Um, so just trying to get. To learn how to do it and what that looks like because uh, there's a lot of different ways that it can be done cool um all right um so i saw a couple waves there thumbs up if anybody else interested in, in talking about this um oh gosh oh there's too many of us actually because i think we wait can we we can't have a quorum right um one two three four five there were five folks interested. Um, so I might actually just bow myself out of this. Uh, is that a good idea? I don't know. Um, let's, well, we can, we can talk about that in a minute. I'm going to, I'm going to pause that conversation. Let's come back to that at the end. Um, other thoughts, questions, actually I have one other thing before I stop talking. Um, I just want to note, I think I sent this to you, Zach, but, um, I know you're replacing the brick arch lining. Uh, on Taylor Street, uh, I would just, I, I know I said this to you before, I just want to say it again, I would love to see any pictures, if any exist, of that infrastructure, because I just think that would be super interesting. All right, we'll make sure we get some to you. Awesome, thanks. Um, other thoughts, questions, ideas? Uh, Lauren, and then Dan. Uh, no, I just... Kind of piling on it, I'm, just, I'm glad there's so much interest in the stormwater utility idea. Um, I think one one other piece that I think would be really exciting is um, a lot of conversations like I've had with developers and others about how you could get creative about doing stormwater projects where you could pool multiple properties so that you could save money for you know individual people's obligations, but get better stormwater outputs and stuff. So I just think there's a lot of potential. So just excited and sorry it's really loud at my house all of a sudden <laughs> so apologies all good uh dan yeah i i, I guess I, I i would strike a note of caution on some of this one is i i'd look to see what other municipalities in vermont have done and where the authorization has come from you know because of the dylan's rule state that you know other states may be able to do this because they have greater authority um i know that uh morrisville has done this something similar with their wastewater, uh, especially with the breweries up there, um, and they've run into some some issues. I think we just have to be careful if we start to impose these type of, um, you know, utility charges that we create, we make sure we don't, um, as you suggested, you know, uh, cause people to lose incentives to improve the stormwater treatment on their own properties um, or put people in a very difficult position where they have to choose between um, 
you know, Im improvements to the house or fixing a longstanding existing drainage system that predates their ownership. And I guess, uh, you know, it's just being in a river valley like we are, water flows everywhere. Um, and I think we just, I think we just have to be thoughtful about any, any approach in this, in this, uh, in this direction. That's all I'll say. Fair enough. Um, it's a good call. I mean, I've also heard South Burlington has done something similar. At least there's some folks that we can look at. Um, it'd be interesting yeah. to see if they have particular permission in, in their charter to do something like this. Well, that, that's, that's what I would want to know is where they get the authority to, you know, what the source of authority is and the scope of authority and what their plan, what they, what they do from it. Um, you know, because I'm sure it's six different versions of it, if it exists. Yeah. Um, so, so Zach, you said you're also interested in this. Yes. Uh, um, uh, just to come back to uh, just. We only need. You can have five at this. Um, if we only had, gosh, we can only have three of us as council members on such a group. Um, so who's like super excited, passionate, wants to do it? <laughs> now everybody's going to back out. <laughs> who's up for it? We got Jay. Count me in. Lauren. Uh oh, I'm. Oh, Lauren's hand go up. I'm a little again. I, I was. I, I just was frozen again. Did anybody else raise their hand? Lauren. Oh, Lauren. Okay. So if it's if it's uh, me, Jay, and, and Lauren, um, Zach, can I, I? I don't know if I can say this, but it would make sense to me. Um, if, Zach, if you're willing to like just email us and see if we can find a, a day to meet. Um, yep. Does that sound okay? Yes, it does. Okay. We'll assume it's Zach and figure out, but yes. Staff will Sorry, set up. Say again? Staff will set up a meeting. Okay. Okay. Fabulous. Fabulous. Well, okay, I well, think just, just, just to bring the last two items together, you know, the stormwater was such a um, guiding factor in the design of the new playground at Union um, and how we managed that because it was, you know, besides being a brownfield site, but it, you know, was such a failure in terms of what it was contributing to, to stormwater in the city and, um, you know, but not understanding necessarily what sort of guidelines the project was, you know, beholden to or on behalf of the city, or if, if, you know, this is sort of a time to establish those, but you know, that, it was a big project and, um, but it was, and it was a real priority to it. And it, it turned out to be a learning opportunity for the students to understand sort of the impact that, 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 you know, sort of the place where their school sat, you know, made a difference to what happened in the city. So I think that, you know, thinking about these issues on, on that sort of scale is really important. Uh, Jack. I, ju I just think it's a good thing to be, moving forward and, and addressing uh, as it, I didn't jump on it as being one of the people who has to has to be there because I don't think I have to be there but I do think it's good that we should be doing it because I still hear um, every so often from someone who lives in Montpelier or someone who doesn't live in Montpelier who will say well just don't build anything as long as there's uh, sewer overflows going on never build anything in the city. And I think that is uh, clearly not a responsible uh, policy or position to take, but uh, making progress on all the possible uh, runoff uh, solutions is a good response to that. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, all right, any other further thoughts, comments? Okay. Um, thank you all for uh, putting this together. I think this was really helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, it's good to know how the infrastructure is under the streets. Uh, all right. So, thank you. Uh, all right, so we're going to move on to the street painting policy.
And for that, I probably should turn it over to Dan. That's what I was going to say. Well, you know, it's um, so there's a couple of different components to this. Um, uh, I drafted this up as a way for us to, as a city council, to have a policy for people that come requesting street painting um, on the streets of Montpelier. You know, this was a, probably a non-issue uh, six months ago. It's now a hot topic um, in the past 60 days. Um, what this policy is intended to do is, is create some sort of clarity, first of all, why the city is, how the city is, um, is, is functioning, and it starts with the statutory authority, and I'll, I'll just sort of walk through the street painting policy that, uh, the, the draft, and it starts with the statutory authority, um, which begins in Title 19, um, that says that all towns and cities um, have general supervision and control over all roads within the city limits. Um, this authority is subject to the general power of the Vermont Agency of Transportation, uh, general supervision of all, which has general supervision of all transportation functions on state highways and concurrent jurisdiction over all class one town highways under 19 BSA section uh, 1101. So the purpose of this policy is, is really to maintain our primary obligation is to maintain public roads in a safe manner to allow citizens in, of the city and the general public to travel safely across and within the city's geographic boundaries. This maintenance includes plowing, sanding, patching, repa repaving, as well as painting and repainting traffic lines and signals. Um, and so th the idea of that is to really state that our main purpose of these roads is still to for safe travel and, and transit. They're right-of-ways that um, are mainly for pedestrian and motor vehicle traffic. Um, but, you know, we have had individuals and groups requesting permission to paint decorative and political displays in the public streets. And I, this policy is intended to clarify that this is not um, an application process where people would have vested rights in it, but it is a process for us as a city council to evaluate requests and to determine um, whether we choose to accept them or not, because I think this is the, what I suspect is that we're going to see more of these requests rather than fewer. Um, and certainly now that the door has sort of opened, now people want to understand, well, how can I paint something on my street, whether it be State Street, uh, Langdon Street, or Park Street in front of the school. Um, and so there's a definition section um, then it talks about, you know, the estate authority, and the idea is that um, if, if it's a class one highway or something where VTrans has um, concurrent jurisdiction, um, you know, we would recognize that jurisdiction and that VTrans may have their own process of reviewing it um, and that the city would facilitate that. And, and basically, we're not looking to usurp or alter that relationship. The second section deals with public safety you know, that first and foremost, any project cannot interfere with the public safety uh, of these roads um, and create what I've termed an unreasonable degradation of pedestrian or motor vehicle safety. So, you know, we had this discussion with the Black Lives Matter mural, which is, you know, is it safe or unsafe for people to drive over it? And so some of the issues that we added to that was to add grit to the paint to make sure that it, it, it stayed um, it had texture that allowed tires to grip, as well as, you know, noting that it was on a straightaway and a low, um, uh, low speed area so that the risk was not unreasonable. Section three talks about the request process. And this is something what I've drafted here talks about the, <clears throat> since we're not talking about an application or, you know, requiring the public to come forward with this, um, it's really about um, you know, do we as a city council want to take up any of these requests? And so, you know, really the request to install a project should, should originate either from us as a council or um, a city councilor who's approached about a, a project. Because I think at the end of the day, we're ultimately looking to um, paint things that are coming from and support the community that we represent. Um, and so that reinforces that 
idea that we would, um, you know, it would have to come through, it would be sponsored and introduced by one or more members of city council for review and deliberation. Um, if a private individual group wants to make the request, you know, they've, they've, they've got to approach a city councilor and get a city councilor to sponsor it. And, you know, there's, there's six of us plus the mayor, seven effectively, um, you know, one of us should be able to sponsor that and also then work with that group to address some of these issues. Um, section four talks about project location um, and just sort of setting out some of the, I think, safety basics, um, uh, you know, that we don't want it to be on the very busy street. So if somebody says, I want to do it on Memorial Drive or I want to do it, I mean, we don't have jurisdiction, but, you know, the interstate, obviously, um, that creates met, uh, a lot more problems and we want it to be, uh, and I borrowed this from some of the research that I did, uh, 10,000 vehicle per day or less because it's easier to stop traffic. It's also less likely to wear um, and it's just simpler. And so we just block off those high traffic route two type streets. Um, also saying that the project should be located in a mid block area away from intersections or markings leading up to an intersection project has to be de designed to avoid interference with crosswalks and on-street parking spaces. Um, you know, and also noting that if, if, if we do get applications for residential neighborhoods, that they carry a different impact. It's one thing to paint something on State Street or Langdon Street. It's another to paint something in front of somebody's house. And I can see concerns about residents having um, that something might, you know, either impact their daily lives and their house or property values or some other concern that I think is different than um, in our public sphere of the downtown. Section five really talks about prohibited locations, um, areas that would be just really unsafe. Um, so these are just portions of the roadway that include school zone markings or railroad markings, approaches to signalize intersections within 200 feet, as these typically inter turn lanes, arrows and stop bars. So wherever a street's likely to have a lot of painting already, we don't want to interfere or obscure that. Um, crosswalks, bike lanes, and parking spaces, unless a project can be designed around such features and will not obscure them. And that's something I think we raised when we considered the Black Lives Matter project is, you know, making sure that that crosswalk was still delineated and clear um, in, in that project. Um, you know, so it goes through some of these things. Section six talks about design guidelines and standards. Um, and this is really uh, two, two areas that I sort of, um, guidelines are really things that we may consider as, as a city council. And I just tried to articulate similar to the flag policy, what are we trying to do here? And why are we having this policy? And so the guidelines are really about, you know, enhancing the community identity, pride and unity, the providing the highest quality artwork available, promoting excellence and demonstrating diversity in various media. Um, so it's so, sort of these aspirational things that we would, we would look to as we were evaluating this process project. And so that someone who wanted to make a request could look to and say, well, you know, this is why you should, why you should adopt this. And then the second part standards is really much more about the, you know, the, the, the real things that we really don't want. We don't want logos and commercial speech. We don't want, um, issues with copyright. We don't want, you know, someone's living image who hasn't given permission to do it. Um, you know, I, I really don't want my face on State Street. And if somebody wants to do it, they're going to ask me first. Um, you know, no images of the United States flag because that's inconsistent with our flag code. No profanity or obscene material. Um, I, you know, a project may not be designed to be located, so it's perceived to be commenting on or modifying or altering an existing project. Um, you know, that the, um, that there, has, there has to be an overall pro positive message. Um, and, and then it gets into um, some, I think, more just the basic, you know, that the projects have enough grit to grip tires on the roadway, um, that they don't mimic traffic control devices. Um, you know, we don't have any Wile E. Coyote type designs on the, on the street. Um, you know, the project, uh, the paint is applied in a precise and high quality manner. I think that's something, you know, we, we really, we didn't consider when we initially get granted the Black Lives Matter, but it's certainly something I thought about afterwards is like, what if it's not painted well? Um, 
what if it's ugly, you know, what if it, what if it's there spills or, you know, people avoiding it. I think we, we want to make sure that anything that does get painted because it is ultimately reflective of what we want in the city, that it, it, it looks nice. And so that would be sort of these standards. Section seven just talks about the review process, trying to make it very clear, you know, that, that the first step is to go and look at the technical issues with DPW, with VTRANS, to make sure that, you know, we're not, there, there, there's not like some threshold issue. The second step would be review by city council when we would take it up that, you know, at that point, DPW and VTRAN says we're all, all set to go. Um, this, the third step would be installation, how it's to be installed. Um, and, and also underlying the fact that, you know, these become city property immediately upon completion. Um, you know, holding any, any group that wants to donate and work with us that we adopt for this, this type of painting, um, you know, that they, they have, we're clear about the standards and what we're expecting. Um, and then after with the post installation, you know, that, that any of this work is done in a clean manner, people clean up, they don't dump their paint down the city uh, stormwater sewers, you know, that we have to put a utility charge on it for them. Um, you know, and that uh, that the city, re you know, holds the right to revoke the pro uh, the project at any time and any reason, um, even after installation, if we decide, you know, this was a bad idea and we want to paint over it, we would have, you know, we just want to make clear that that's to anyone so that nobody's surprised about this. And this is less about setting out necessarily anybody's quote unquote rights under this and more just an an exercise in, in clarity and just making sure that we're all clear. This is how we see this. This is any requester who comes in says, you know, can, can say, oh, I knew that because this is what the policy says. Section nine, which is the last section, just deals with maintenance and repair, which is if somebody's going to donate this to us, they can't just donate it and walk away unless we want them to. Um, but that the normal expectation would be that they would maintain it so that if somebody drives over it and squeals their tires, they would be responsible for repainting it. Or, you know, if it, if some of the paint goes, gets, gets laid up, they would be the ones who would work with the city. Um, you know, and again, I think these are things that if this, we, the city choose to paint something, it would, we would effectively be doing this ourselves. But if a private group wanted to work with us and we accepted that request, this is what the expectations would be um, and, and laying that out. So that's essentially, and I, I apologize, that's the, a prosaic walkthrough um, of, of this policy, but the idea is, again, trying to make it very clear, um, make it very transparent as to what our expectations are um, and what our policies um, involving in this are so that if somebody wants them, uh, wants to make that request, they don't have to guess. I'll take questions now. Okay. Um, thank you, Dan. Um, uh, Donna. I, I just immensely. I'm so impressed, Dan. It's just awesome. I, I do have some comments, but it's just so inclusive and covers so much i'm really really impressed and pleased if, if i could ask a couple of questions of like section three in your request for process it talks about the project may originate from city council and yet over in section seven which you verbally mentioned um, the primary contact may obtain a uh, must obtain a sponsor when you talked about section three, you mentioned the sponsorship, but here you have to get all the way to seven before you understand that it either originates with the council or it has a sponsor. Is that not yep. what that? No. So it's somehow join them together. And that's a, that's a that's a fair. Uh, you know, it, it probably. I mean, it says in section three, if a private group or individual desires to have a project considered, it must be sponsored and introduced by one or more members of city council for review or deliberation. Um, is that, that's the same language. Um, yeah, I mean, that's. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. I don't know if that if that satisfies. I mean, I can make it a little bit more clear. Um, well, no. In your section three, you you do have a sentence about it, but in section seven, it it, it isn't. Anyway, it just. When there's two requirements and they're not both mentioned, I guess, that are so similar about city council, I just wondered if you didn't want to refer to section three and section seven, but maybe sure. that's just being nitpicky. Um, likewise, if I look at what we did with Black Lives Matter, it was really generated from a sort of a disorganized group. There was, there was no formal organization. So how would they have gotten insurance? You know that's something we could obviously waive um and that's that's a good question or we could use our own i mean that was just something I was gonna say the city can always choose to ensure it if it's the city's speech okay well i assume that would the city would do it if this if it came from the city council but i wasn't sure if we just had you know a, a counselor sponsoring it from a loose group well so can I jump in right here again? I mean, my view of this, and, and, and I want to make sure I don't misinterpret Dan's, is essentially what we're saying is anything that goes on the streets is from the city council. Now, someone may ask us to do it, but a councilor has to sponsor it, and the council has to vote to do it. So, it, you know, we're controlling that. It's not the same as just, I'm getting a permit to go do this. It's really the city's going to do it. Now, we might let you paint it for us, but it's still us. And that's a little bit of a difference. Any yes. this is always the city, right? Yes. And I used in I used the word may is just primary contact may be required to provide proof of insurance and name the city as co-insured. And you know I could imagine if you had, for example, um, you know just a, a large uh, project where somebody wanted to paint at various locations and they were or an organized group and they did have the insurance you know, why we wouldn't take advantage of that. Right, um, right, no, okay, I got you. Good, good. And likewise, when it comes to no logos, is Black Lives Matter a trademark? Is it, or something like that? Could it be challenged as almost a logo? That's a fair question. Um, you know, I, <laughs> Obviously, I, I was intending it as 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 really, you know, avoiding like the Nike swoosh or something right. like that. That was clear commercial speech. And, right. Everything else there is about commercial or advertising, but uh, logos and trademarks and, you know, slogans. I just, um, anyway, I'd like to bring it up for discussion. Sure. And the other piece was, can the city... If they're responsible for maintaining and repairing, then at any point we can say, if this is going to stay on the street for the time we've given you, you've got to come back and restore it? Or what? We cover it up? Yeah, I I mean, I think that would be up to us as a city council to decide, um, you know, what I... Um, so, you know... Uh, for example, um, you know, if if they if the group that in, the primary contact just disappeared um, and it looked terrible, we, we may step in and 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 remove it. Um, but I think it's the idea that you know it's trying to make anyone who's requesting this, if if we ch if we so chose you know, to make them sort of an ongoing responsibility. Because there was that question right after the Black Lives Matter was was um, vandalized. Well, who fixes it? And who's going to fix it? And, you know, do we let, um, you know, if somebody does some, some type of, you know, either purposeful or accidental that, that alters or makes it look less appealing? I mean, I think we face the same thing, not on a public street, but with the mural that... Um, was installed next to Julio's, you know, it becomes a question that fades after a year, who, who does that fixing? And I think all this is intending to set up is that, mm -hmm. you know, we really want, if somebody's going to go through the effort of requesting this, donating this to us, you know, we kind of say, well, you know, it's not just a one-off kind of thing. We, we would, we would see you as, as an ongoing partner in, in its maintenance, just yeah. as if, 
just as if, for example, you know, uh, someone donated a, a monument, um, like a Ten Commandments monument or something we put into a park, and, you know, they would have the perpetual care of, of maybe cleaning it or take that responsibility. And if that group folded up, we would have to decide as a city what to do with that. Um, but it would be that kind of relationship, just as I think a lot of other people do. And I don't know, Bill, if... if um, any of the fraternal order, the police societies maintain that monument outside of city hall, or if that's a city hall um, obligation. No. Okay. I, I just I know right. another. It's a good point. No, it's 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 well written on that part. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Jack. Thanks. Uh, thanks for all the work on this, uh, Dan. What I, I'm just a little unsure. I think I think we need to be very clear that anything that is painted on the streets is as the uh, as the court said that we in the case that that you and I both uh, referred to in uh, in our previous meeting. It's a statement of the city government and we're uh, we're saying it because because it's what we believe or whatever and so I, I'm I'm just struggling with the idea of do we need something this extensive or do we need to say something much simpler which is the uh, that paragraph right after the purpose where you say any project painted or installed within a public street is ultimately a piece of public art controlled by the city and is a statement of the city's values consistent with government speech and maybe not say anything else. I, I don't know. It's, uh, that's the underlying question that I've sort of been struggling with in my mind. Um, the other more technical question is, especially when we, when we talk about putting time limits, uh, removing it if uh, the person uh, fails to maintain it or something like that, is how this might interact with, uh, with the Visual Artists' Rights Act, which um, I don't know that much about, but it uh, it vests uh, certain limited rights in the uh, in the creator of a piece of visual art um, that uh, the creator might be able to enforce, and we see that it's uh, that's part of what's uh, been discussed both in the. Uh, mural in Burlington and the mural down at, uh, at Vermont Law School is do the artists have rights to either take it back and take it somewhere uh, and you know reclaim ownership of the of the work or to resist uh, an effort to uh, to remove it or obliterate it so I don't know what the answers to all those things are but I know that uh, those things uh, do come up. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, if I can respond, um, yeah, I think your larger philosophic question is a fair one. Um, and if I have any discomfort about this, it's that, um, you know, this is a longer, um, a longer draft than I intended it necessarily to be um, when I started drafting it, only because I think there were these issues that I I felt merited some reference, um, but um, you know, as far as time limits or maintenance, you know, maybe we want to um, be more obscure about that. I I was thinking about it more in line with the uh, flag policy, which is that we adopted this flag policy. We said, you know, if, if we fly a flag do it for 30 days unless we decide differently. And I was thinking that, you know, if, if we wanted to set sort of a default of what we would consider some of these, these murals, you know, we'd set it for a year 
in some ways that would go towards the the Vera um, concern, which is that you know I think the Vera rights kick in when you create these these permanent monuments. And my my reading my ba very basic understanding of Vera was that it's the um, it's really about removal and the artist's right to the work after it's removed. The thing about a street mural, of course, is that it can't be removed except by obliterating it. Um, so unlike the murals on, in Burlington, there are actually panels that can be um, you know, unscrewed, taken off the wall um, and, and stored and redisplayed somewhere else. Um, and I'm not sure about the, the law school, uh, if they're quite the same way or if they're actually going to have to carve out the drywall. Um, but either way, if there's some way for that to, um, to be preserved, I think you have to give the artist that ability to do it. But in a medium like this, where you're basically, you know, uh, drawing it on the street and if this, and if under the terms of what we, we allow or we adopt, uh, for, for being painted on the street is essentially something that is transient, um, that doesn't last forever, um, lasts a significant period of time, but you know, ultimately has has an end. I think there may be um, my my understanding of putting that in there was just a way of of you know cutting cutting those rights short because they were always understood to be limited. But you know, these are all fair points. Uh, Connor. Well, first off, Dan, this is a fantastic. I, it's pretty prolific. I could, could never even have drafted more than a page myself, I think. Um, quick question. Um, when you say it's like for a fixed period of time, do you envision the council making that determination upon approval of the project? Or could that be an open question at the time where you say, okay, enough is enough after like three or four months? Yeah, I, I, I think it could be an open question. I mean, it's, it's whatever we want to do it. You know, this is our speech. As, as Bill pointed out, um, this is something that we're choosing to do. Um, and this is just, again, these aren't, necess these aren't intended to create standards or rights. And they're really intended to help us so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time somebody comes, you know, says, hey, I'd like to paint X, Y, or Z. Yeah, Dan, just a quick question, just to clarify. So something like what Montpelier Alive did with Rob Pitzig in the parking lot um, outside of Julio's, that falls outside of this policy. Right. That's because that's not a, uh, a public right away. Gotcha. Yeah. So that would just, yeah, I mean, it's private property and it's, it's up to the, you know, the property owner to be able to manage that process. Right. Great. Any other questions? Comments, thoughts? Okay, well, I am also very grateful, Dan, for all of your work on this. This looks great. Um, I, I think it's uh, pretty, pretty thorough and uh, I think outlines a great process. So um, for this, actually, so Dan, would you mind like unsharing your screen at this point? Cool, thank you. Um, and uh, so just to uh, check back on this, um, this is not an ordinance, this is just a policy. So, but we should probably still, uh, if this is something we wanna do, then it's probably something we should still um, vote to approve. Um, so I'm just gonna check what our suggested language was here review and approve right so um is there any um motion regarding uh the policy uh jack this isn't a motion but it just occurred to me as we were sitting here through this discussion that it might be of value to seek comment from the uh Montpelier public arts commission
Um, yeah, potentially. Um, are too. May, may have frozen. Here. Uh, other thoughts on that? Donna, are you uh, jumping in? I mean, to me, part of having this policy is if somebody wants to do a street painting, these are the circumstances and the limitations of which they do it. So um, I don't particularly see that need. Okay. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy either way um someone wants to make a motion great if you would rather wait um, we can do and get comment from the public arts folks that's okay too would anyone, would anyone like to make a motion i certainly will make a motion we'll see if it goes or not um a motion <laughs> cool. to uh, approve the street painting policy as presented Is there a second? Second. You know, and if indeed we find additional comments, we can edit it. I think it's a wonderful document. Right, and and I, I, I think that it, it could be sort of you know something we revisit and modify if if you know we don't like certain policy or if the public arts commission says we can't do this, it's going to kill us. Because we want, I don't know, we, we want to put in fake crosswalks. We want to put in, mm -hmm. um, and we have a good reason for it. Yeah. Okay, so there's been a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And, and opposed. Okay, so the street painting policy uh, passes. And I, again, thank you, Dan, for all your work on this. Really great. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah. Okay, um, and so we're going to move on to uh, the possible reinstatement of parking meter fees. And for that, I assume I'm turning it over to Bill. Yeah, and I think you you all pretty much have the outline of this. Um, we had furloughed our employees. They came back in August, uh, although the return of employees isn't necessarily the, the only reason to do this, but clearly um, we're seeing some more activity downtown and we don't know how much of it is people parking there all day and how much of it is people parking because they're visiting. So we're, we'd like to cautiously roll out parking enforcement, review it again in mid-September. Uh, the idea being uh, we've already had sort of a warning period right now where people are only getting warnings. If, if you were to approve reinstating the, the parking fees, then starting next Monday, we would begin active enforcement. But the plan would be for, um, for the parking lots to remain free. And that would give us some sense of how many people are sort of parking all day versus people that are shopping downtown. And we may need to modify that as we go. Like to you know, make this, we don't want to create a disincentive for people to shop downtown in, in this tough time. On the other hand, we, we have checked and all the other communities in Vermont that have parking meters have already got theirs working, have had theirs working. We're the last ones to do so. So we're not necessarily, you know, rushing in to, to take advantage of people, but um, we think it's time. And again, we can you know, we turned it off quickly at one meeting and we can do that again, uh, but we're asking for your approval of our reinstatement plan. Okay, um, so thoughts, comments about reinstating parking meter fees? Uh, Connor and then Dan. Yeah, and no, I, I think it's time I've spoken to enough businesses in town where I think there was, I think like it was a good idea to turn them off. Um, and I, I think that did help our downtown uh, business for a bit there, but enough of them are starting to see people just sort of like languishing, like Bill says, in front of the stores all day there, which is causing other people who need to get into town, sort of parking pretty far away. So I think it's time to turn the lights back on. That's... Yeah, I'll, I was just gonna echo Connor's um, sentiment as well. I've talked to downtown businesses that people are ready. 
that seems like an encouraging sign <laughs> if you're talking to businesses and they're like, no, it's time. <laughs> That's good. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Uh, Jay? Well, I'm just curious why um, why do it differently with lots as opposed to on street or as opposed to just doing a blanket? You know, ultimately, it's a policy call and we don't have to do it that way. We could We could just turn the lots on too. I think some of it from our perspective was to try to learn something, it was to see how many of these were all day, you know, if, if presumably someone's parking all day in front of their store or, or their employee of a store or whatever, or they're just an apartment dweller and they're taking an on-street parking spot all day, they'll move to the lot and we'll get some sense of, then we'll get a chance to see what the actual downtown business traffic is. Now, obviously savvy downtown business traffic people can move to lots. It's also fair to say that right now th there's no state employees in state building. So all those lots are open and free. So, you know, I mean, um, so, you know, the, the idea is in September, we'll turn the lots back on as fall comes. We're trying to, we're trying to learn something and also slowly do this so that if, you know, if someone complains about it being a hardship, we say, Hey, there's free lots. So that's, that's why there's no science to it. If the council, if you all prefer to just go turn everything back on, we can do that too. That was a great question, and I, you know, it, it gives this the context of being sort of almost like a phased reopening in that sense. Yeah, that was our um, thing. Again, there's nothing, there's no science to it. Yeah. Uh, Jack? Um, what is yet left to do to uh, get uh, Parkmobile uh, running? Sorry. So we're working with them now. Um, we've got to finalize our agreements with them. It takes them about two months to get everything set up and computerized and working with our systems. Uh, and then obviously all the stickers on the lot. So it's it's inactive. You don't, you don't need to do anything. We're, we're on it. Okay. Well, is there a motion to reactivate uh, Donna uh, yes I'm really glad that everyone supports this and we'll make the motion to reactivate on-street parking meters and actively enforcing and issuing tickets starting August 17th which is next Monday second okay hey, there's a motion and a second any further questions or discussion okay all in favor please say aye aye aye, aye. And yes, I, I have a follow up question. Okay. At one point, we were told that the meters needed upgrading, and there's a lot of cost in that. So, what's the status of that bill? Uh, well, so it depends how much time you want to spend on it. They do need upgrading, it is expensive. We're delaying it because of cost, and we, you know, we don't know right now, we don't think the parking fund can support it. Um, the reason, so, so the reason it needed upgraded is that the, the meters that we have now um, use wireless, but they use 2G technology. Okay. And we're told that 2G is good, was supposed to be gone by December 31. So our remote meters wouldn't work. Now we're told, well, maybe it's going to be in the spring. So there's a little bit of a gamble, you know, can we put this money in the budget? Can we see how parking revenues are working. Can we see, you know, can we take a look at this? One of the reasons for using for that actually prompted us to move faster on park mobile, uh, because that gives us another alternative for people to use instead of credit cards. If for some reason our remote readers go that you know, are out because 2G suddenly goes away, people will still be able to pay by an app or put coins in. So okay. the meters can still do it's it's the the electronic functioning. So yes, okay. they are expensive. Yes, they need technically to be upgraded. Um, we're taking a gamble here because of the financial circumstances to push it off till at least spring and get through the budget and see how everything's going. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, I I didn't actually ever ask if there were any no votes. So would anyone like to vote now? I don't think we voted at all yet. Oh, we said we. 
Well, you did half of it. Yeah. We did the <laughs> so you did the eyes. Okay. Yeah. So, and uh, I'm not hearing anyone voting no. Here's your chance to vote against parking. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, with all that, the, the motion carries. And so, we'll be reinstating the parking fees on the 17th. Um, great. Thank you. Any other, no other follow ups to that, I assume? Um, okay. Uh, so moving on, um, we have some design review, uh, proposed, uh, zoning changes or updates. I guess this, this is just an update, right? Um, this, for, this is actually <laughs> some information that's been sent to you. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so go ahead, Mike. All right. Um, so I'll just, I've got a quick presentation. I don't know if uh, Cameron needs to share with me or if I just share myself. Um, actually, before we get going, I just want to recognize it is 844. Do you want to take a break? This is also a second to last item. Break, no break. No, oh, I'm seeing no break. If you... <laughs> It's a five. It's a five six minute presentation, so it's really quick. Cool. So, Mike, the only documents that I have are from the agenda, um, so I can make it so you can share your screen. So you should be able to share that now. Okay. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna jump into it, and if you need to step out, that's okay. Um, cool. All right, and. Hopefully that's good for everybody. Yeah. Um, so um, for anyone um, who doesn't know me, I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director for the city. And I'm here tonight just to give you a quick summary outline of two zoning amendments that have been sent to you from the planning commission. The actual hearing for these two will be on the 26th, uh, which is two weeks from now, but I want to give you an outline of what you've received so far. So you have a framework to kind of do your reviews. So tonight we'll look at the, uh, just the history, 50,000 foot view of the design review changes. Um, also what changes are being proposed for the design review boundary. And finally, take a look at some small changes on Pioneer Street um, to two parcels that are due to some nonconformity issues. And then I'll take any questions, but again, we don't really have to take a lot of them if, um, because the, the public hearing is really in two weeks. It's really just kind of give you guys an outline. So um, some of you will remember that the Planning Commission had proposed some big design review changes in the process that led up to the zoning bylaws when they were changed in 2018. And those changes that had been proposed found very little support. So the Planning Commission coordinated with the Historic Preservation Commission to look at some alternatives. And the HPC took these up in 2017 and started by reviewing standards from around Vermont, around the country. And they hired a consultant, Landworks, to help with the rule development um, in the early process. And what they came up with was really sick. Um, six goals to the new rewrite, including trying to make applications predictable and decisions more defensible. And this really came as a result of um, the current rules that we have fall short of some Vermont Supreme Court guidelines, which are what we refer to as the JAM golf decisions. Um, for example, one rule in our design regulation simply states that the, the design review committee shall evaluate plans based on the location and appearance of all utilities. That's all our regulations say. There's no guidance that goes along with that. And that really falls short of what um, is, is required for, for basics on regulations. Um, applicant has no way of knowing that they're in compliance and reviewers have no basis to approve or deny an application. Um, so really that was, the, the, one of the primary driving forces of making these changes. Some other considerations uh, that they looked at were to continue with design review and not move to historic design review. The, the state law differentiates between these two. 
and the historic preservation felt design review was was more appropriate, which is what we had been doing. Um, they chose rehabilitation standards. National Park Service has other standards, but they chose rehabilitation standards as our level of review. Um, and we wanted to more flexibility with clear exemptions and options for administrative permits. Not everything needs to go to the board and we should build those off ramps into our regulations as, as we did in the rest of the zoning. And it, that has functioned really well for the city so far over the past two years that we've been using the new regulations. And they felt the development of a review guidebook would be needed. Now the guidebook hasn't been made yet because that would be an expensive process and we really need the regulations first. Um, but once these rules are adopted, they would start moving forward on, on developing a guidebook so that we would really have um, some help for reviewers and applicants. So um, the core changes, I'm not going to go through uh, all the changes, but um, first, just so everybody knows, this is a total rewrite. Um, it's a strike all in replace of the existing design review rules. Um, what you see here is, is how they organized the changes. Um, they created one set of rules for historic buildings and how you can make changes to those buildings and a second set of rules for non-contributing buildings. Uh, the current rules kind of mix them together and it makes it awkward for decisions, especially when historic rules have to be applied to non-historic buildings. So this setup is going to work much better having a set of rules for each of those groups. Um, and the new process steps, as discussed, there'll be some administrative approvals and some increased exemptions. So the boundary changes was something that the Planning Commission worked on. Um, the biggest concern, again, uh, we try to avoid being arbitrary and our current boundary that we have for design review is is the definition of arbitrary. It doesn't follow any boundaries. It's not the National Historic District, not zoning boundaries. Um, and, and we wanted to change that. These, what you have in the second bullet are just some of the, the guidelines that have to be met. It, the design review must include the designated downtown and it cannot include the capital complex. And where the Planning Commission went with their work was they tried to match it to the neighborhood boundaries that are in the zoning. Um, and, and they had to make some exceptions, but they feel the, the boundaries are much more reasonable, um, what, you, what you have in those boundaries. Um, so where did they end up? Um, mostly it stayed the same with, you know, we didn't make any radical changes to the design review boundary. Um, we kept in VCFA but we have removed CCV. Um, it was always uh, a complicated and, and difficult to understand why certain buildings were, were put in design review. CCV all by itself was put in um, and this is proposed to be removed. National life has con continued to stay in, um, but the boundaries were cleaned up to match their parcel lines. Um, we added the North Street of Berry Street out to Granite Street. Um, currently only one side of Berry Street was in design review, which was kind of strange. Uh, we added Downing Street, which is right down uh, on Berry Street, um, near, down near Main Street. It's a short little, short little street. Um, we also added the rest of the Crossroads neighborhood, which a lot of people refer to as Gasoline Alley. So this is over the Dunkin' Donuts and those. Um, what we had, what we have today is, um, I think one of the gas stations, I think it goes out to school street, but the rest of those buildings like Cumberland farms are not in design review. So if you're the first gas station, you're in design review. If you're the second gas station, you're not in design review. And what we said was we want all of those in design review. Um, we added the redstone building and the rest of the redstone North neighborhood. Um, and we wanted to point out that there are three parcels on Terrace Street, which are the first three parcels. The, they um, are being rezoned in this as well to residential 9000, the neighboring district, as a part of this to move them out of the Redstone North neighborhood. And um, they were originally in 
because they were part of the National Register Historic District in 2016. Um, when it was updated in 2017 or 18, when that National Register District was redrawn, those three parcels were removed. And so in this zoning, we're just going to clean that up. So all of Redstone North is in the National Register District. And that's why they're going to be added into the design review district. So that way the neighborhood matches the National Register boundary and now matches the, the design review. Um, so the last piece is the Pioneer Street proposal. Um, so this was discovered there was, um, through a discussion of a possible application for a project um, on the Barretts. Uh, the Barretts uh, family own the Trading Post building and a number of, um, and all the property on the other side of the railroad tracks as well to the river. So um, all of the self-store units, um, the, the, the growler, building there, uh, the dispensary building. So those are all in the same parcel. Um, and they also own the vacant, there's a vacant parking lot that's been used to sell cars for a number of times. Well, they, they have a proposal to do some, um, do something on that. And the 2018 zoning changes put them into the riverfront district, which made 12 of 13 of their buildings non-conforming as well as a number of the uses. And the same was true of the laser wash car wash, which is the abutting parcel. Um, these parcels abut the Eastern Gateway District on their Eastern edge. And if these parcels were an Eastern Gateway, then all of the uses would be conforming and most of the buildings would be as well. Uh, the area was never directly discussed or considered during the rezoning process in 2018. So the Planning Commission felt it was appropriate to revisit the question. And the Planning Commission reviewed a number of possible solutions and eventually approved a narrow change for only the land between the railroad tracks and River Street. Um, and uh, so that's the, the training post and the vacant um, where the where the auto set used to be and the laser wash. So just those parcels would be shifted to Eastern Gateway, um, which would allow for a certain amount of redevelopment of that parcel. And again, I can pull these maps up if you want to look at them, um, but um, that's the, the quick quick summary of what you have. And the hearing, again, is in two weeks, um, and we can review them uh, further at that time. Or... Uh, hey, Mike, I'll also jump in. And uh, Hi, I'm Kirby Keaton. I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. And uh, I just want to let you guys know that I'm available, too, if you have any questions about what our thoughts were. Uh, this is, these are three pretty big topics that represented months and months of work from us. So I thought you should, I should at least be here to bounce questions off of if you want. Thank you, Kirby. That's great. Anything more, Mike? If not, that's okay. Oh, that, that's it. I mean, I can pull up maps or other things if people want to go and see those, but that's it. So I have a, a couple of questions slash concerns, um, but I, I may hold on to them here uh, and let others go first. Any thoughts, questions, or um, concerns from council? Uh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, uh, let me just maybe uh, understand when the um, Planning Commission adopted the rehabilitative standards from the National um, uh, Park is preservation um why was that standard chosen um as opposed to the other available standards i might have to dive in deeper with uh, if meredith was here she assisted historic preservation they drafted most of those rules um it's not the rehabilitation standards are not the strictest so there are others that are that are stricter than the rehabilitation standards, um, right? And that, I just want, and that's actually my follow up question. If if my understanding is the rehabilitative standards are really rather than a preserve at all costs, it's a uh, preserve to the ability that you're able to rehabilitate something that has 
fallen, um, uh, you know, into disarray or, or, or rot to the extent that it's able to be rehabilitated within a sort of economic spectrum. Is that, yeah, is that the yeah, I believe that's that. That's what they were they were looking for. So, um, and and there was a lot of discussion about that going into it. Um, you know, issues such as as windows and how do we handle, you know, if, if there are a hundred year old windows and you want to replace them, you know, is is the obligation really to preserve the hundred year old window or is the obligation to make sure that the replacement window would not negatively impact the historic character of the building, um, which would mean, yeah, you could remove those and replace them. Um, and the rehabilita rehabilitation standards let you remove those old windows and replace them with a lot of conditions. You have to replace them with in-kind materials, so you can't replace them with vinyl and fiberglass. You'd have to replace them with wood. Um, the, the wood and sash uh, the, the, all the fenestrations have to match. And so there's a lot of those similar requirements, but the answer to the question of, can you replace your windows is yes, you can replace your windows. Had a different standard been picked, it could have said, no, um, you, you have to first ensure that, you know, you can't rehabilitate that, that window. You know, right. You have to preserve it effectively. You have all to preserve it. Yeah. And it's the difference between, um, you know, the, the, you know, at the higher standards, you're looking at the George Washington slept here and we really want to make sure we save everything as opposed to um, we have a, a excellent historic architecture um, and there's a lot of historic character and historic integrity. And what we're trying to do is maintain that historic integrity to the greatest extent possible. And I'll make sure that Meredith is available in two weeks. She's on vacation this week, but in two weeks um, she'll be available. And as I said, she helped draft these rules and she might be able to fill in some of the nuances a little better than I did. Yeah, I just, I do want to understand, because I mean, right now we have sort of an economic hardship test um, where you basically have to show that there's no way to rehabilitate in something of a, you know, without creating some sort of economic hardship, um, which I, I think is a higher standard than what this rehabilitative standard is. It, it's a little bit lower. And, and I think it's sensible, like the example you're talking about on windows or, you know, some of these features that if you replace a, a hundred year old window with a more modern energy efficient window, it's a win-win because People, chances are people won't be able to tell from the outside. Um, but I guess I'm more concerned about some of the bigger architectural features or if somebody has, um, you know, a, a, an outbuilding or something that has a historic character and they just don't want it because they want to pull, you know, turn it into apartments and they want to pull cars into it. Um, just how that, how that standard would necessarily play out. Yeah, a lot of it's going to be case by case, um, but your the the requirement for the for the cost um, does still apply to demolitions. So the, those demolition provisions. So if somebody said, you know, we want to demolish part of a structure that's historic or an entire structure that's historic, that's going to still have that higher bar. You you, we, you can't just go through and demolish the building. Um, it, there is a th that high bar still exists for that piece. But for the elements, and yes, your, your conversation that you've experienced through the DRB process is one that, that we wanted to make sure um, through, the, through the public hearing process, what we heard a lot from the public was there wasn't a lot of consistency over time. So people who had applied in the you know, early 90s would get a different answer than people in the late 90s and people in the 2000s. And, and they felt if the rules haven't changed, there shouldn't be this much difference in how the rules are interpreted. So we wanted to make sure that, and, and this goes to, there wasn't a lot of guidelines. So we wanted to answer those questions up front. You know, can you replace a window? Can you replace the doors? Um, and what would be the requirements if the answer is yes? Um, or what would be the conditions that would have to be met in order to be yes? We shouldn't be having it unknown until you get to the DRB or the DRC. Um, so my understanding 
um, of the rules and my understanding um, working with Meredith is that these new rules are pretty clear about the fact that you can replace these, but they have to be, it, it's, it has to be replaced in, in kind. And that's, that'll be the, you know, the fuzzy term that DRC will have to be dealing with is when people go and apply, um, is this replacement in kind and in kind is that has very specific definitions of the materials and the appearance and the looks and the size, how it, how it sits in the frame. So a window shouldn't be moved out or moved in, in the frame, it should sit in the frame in the same place. So it has the same appearance as before, because sometimes new windows are larger or smaller than the pre-existing ones. Sure. Well, I'm really glad that you um, specifically addressed windows. I mean, that was my first thought um, was, can people replace uh, with single pane with double pane, that kind of thing. Um, and that so that seems pretty satisfactory to me. The other thing that is on my radar is um, roofing materials, and uh, just thinking about how you know there are some roofs that require more maintenance, and um, you know could someone replace a slate roof with a standing seam roof? Um, and that, I mean that's that's not an in kind. I I don't. Maybe it is. Maybe that's an in-kind change as long as the pitch doesn't change and the shape doesn't change, but probably not. I mean, what's what's your no. thought on roofing material? They, they have specific conversations about roofing materials and things such as um, slate roofs. So they have, um, and even with windows, if there's a window that meets a certain classification, then it may be required to be kept and fixed. So um, I try to think of an example. I, over, I think one of the old insurance buildings, there's this fan window of stained glass. Um, and that's a historic window. It's a hundred year old stained glass window. No, you can't replace that. <laughs> you will, that, that's a unique feature of the historic building and it's a part of that building and therefore that is when you have to take the first step of trying to um, maintain it before. Now, if it's falling apart and falling out, then it may not be repairable and it'll have to be um, removed and, and replaced in kind as best as possible. Um, slate roofs, I think, fall into that same category. It's a historic material and you have to try to maintain the slate roof. Now, if it can't be maintained for whatever reason, then that's an issue for the DRC and potentially DRB to address if there's um, if there's a need to remove a slate roof and replace it with some other materials. Um, how about uh, asphalt? I mean, would that be considered historic? If you've got an asphalt roof and replacing with an asphalt roof, um, I in fact, I think that may go under one of those categories of exempt activities or administrative permits. No, but I mean, if you wanted to upgrade your asphalt roof to standing seam, you probably... Uh, it, I would, I'd have to go and say we, that those, a lot of those questions are ones we would have to just look at on a, on a permit by permit basis. You know, I doubt the asphalt would qualify as historic if it's historic, if it's asphalt on a historic building and it's going back to standing seam, it would probably require a permit. I would be very surprised to see the DRC not approve a shift in that direction, but I would imagine that you know, again, very specific questions are always ones that I would leave to Meredith to go and kind of. Well, fair enough. I mean, my um, my reason for asking, really, the the bigger philosophy is that I I don't want to create any impediments to people um, doing energy improvements to their home. First of all, and second of all, um, you know, I mean, gosh, the standing seam roof is just so much less maintenance. Um, that in the end, it's it's just like it's a great investment. Um, so I hate to tell people that like you, yeah, you want to do the, the best, longest lasting thing for your house. Well, you can't. Um, that's that's a, just a tough, that's a tough thing to say. Um, so that that's like my only um, hesitation around that. But it sounds like like I'm, I'm not sure that I could genuinely say that like a standing seam roof is also more energy efficient. I mean, I guess it is from the perspective of like you know it's less energy to keep it you know, maintained, I suppose, over time, but, um, but is there any 
re well, I guess if the windows are like a historic feature, um, Anyway, other, other than that, there's no reason why people wouldn't be able to make energy improvements to their home. No, in, in fact, compared compared to the rules we have now, it would it, you certainly have many more paths to get there. Um, in fact, we've you know Meredith and I have talked about, and, and we talked with the HPC, and they they did understand that. Um, it would be technically possible to go through and say remove clabbered siding to insulate a house and replace it with new clabbered siding as long as it was in kind. It would, you know, it have to be wood. It would have to have the same fenestrations that were on there before. It would have to have the same clabbered width and it would have to be, you know, there, there's a lot of things that would have, but under the old rules, you, you really couldn't. It was, or it was much harder. To, to make that degree of change. Um, the rehabilitation standards, as we said, really are looking at that ability to replace in kind, and that would allow opportunities like being able to get in to make insulation, um, to, to replace windows or doors. Um, and, and we're really gonna be trying our best to maintain in kind um, the appearance of the buildings. Uh, obviously, HPC and probably the design review committee are going to want as much as possible to try to maintain the historic integrity. We don't want to lose, you know, we don't want people just pulling off the scrolling, you know, artwork off of the, you know, the undersides of their eaves and replacing it with new. Um, we would rather keep the historic as, as much as possible, but the new rules are, are, much more flexible about allowing that in situations where where it really is necessary to do. Okay, thank you. I thought I might have seen a hand from Dan. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of respond to, to some of that. I mean, I, I, at least in my experience, the on the DRB and the DRC was that the bigger concern was not necessarily energy efficiency or doing those type of improvements, but shortcuts people would take um, in renovations or work that would cause a degradation of the building. You know, so for example, having a mansard roof is an expensive proposition on a house and it's far easier to just turn it into a giant box. And we have a couple examples in Montpelier before the DRC mm -hmm. where they did that. And so, you know, that that's the kind of, or people taking wooden windows that have lasted for 125 years and replacing them with a lower quality vinyl window that, you know, eventually warps and gets out of shape within, you know, a dozen or so years. And so, I mean, I, I, I think that these standards, as long as they're, you know, the sensible replacement of things like a window or a roof where you're going and it's not a, I mean, even slate, slates are really, I mean, we're still using slate. And I guess the example that I, I think of when I think about like roof replacement materials, I, I used to have a tin roof on my porch that was, you couldn't replace it. They just didn't make it anymore. It's now rubber roofs. Um, and it served the purpose of a rubber roof in the 19th century or something. Um, so there was no way to replace it. You had to use a different type of material. Um, but I mean, these type of, I, I think it's anything that gears people towards thoughtful replacement, um, you know, is, is good because of, if we don't, there's too much of an economic incentive to cut corners on some of these things and to replace and not saying everyone does it, but it's just, it's out there. And if you're doing uh, a buy a building to rent it for profit, you're going to be looking at those bottom lines and that takes away the quality of these, ha these properties and these houses over time. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, other thoughts, questions. Um, I, I guess I'll just also speak for myself and say in the proposed boundary change on Pioneer Street, um, I am interested in just diving into what the uh, allowable uses were in the river uh, corridor zoning um, as opposed to the Eastern Gateway. Um, just thinking about like what the intention was uh, 
potentially for including, um, I mean, maybe it was an oversight, um, but I, I also, um, yeah, I mean, I, I also question like, if what's the best use on that property? And it's non-conforming and that I'd, I'd like to consider that carefully. If they, uh, the planning commission really um, chewed these over quite a bit. So the riverfront is the same zoning district that runs all the way down Barry Street. So it really is um, that that high density residential mixed use um, multi story buildings um, pedestrian oriented that intent as is, is your riverfront district and um, what Eastern Gateway is 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 the area out on Route 2 and out on Route 302 um, which are more auto oriented um, and it's not necessarily that we want them to remain auto oriented oriented forever but that's really where they are now um, and the issue kind of comes up with this we've got a car wash that's non-conforming and is a single story structure and we've got a vacant parking lot. Um, there isn't a sidewalk on that side of the street. It doesn't have the pedestrian access. Um, the um, self store units, the, the small warehouse, mini warehouse units are non conforming in riverfront. They're not allowed in the riverfront district. This parcel is obviously now in the riverfront district. So all those uses are non conforming and can't be expanded. Um, the uses historically that have been here have been, um, they've had sold cars on that parking lot. That's non-conforming now. Um, so really, as you kept looking over the possible uses for the Barretts as to how they would redevelop their, their parking lot, um, a number of uses that they have used are now non-conforming. A number of uses that are there are non-conforming. Um, they recognized that if they did build something, they would have to build to our new um, there are higher design standards now for Eastern Gateway than previously. So they would have to, to if they did self-store units or if they did something else there that was Eastern Gateway and auto-oriented, that it would have to meet that higher design standard and they recognize that. But um, they would like to at least have the option to be able to build either additional self-store units or some other possible uses on that site. And the Planning Commission's concern was looking at the whole parcel was they looked at that lower area next to the river um, and they felt that they really did not want Eastern Gateway and any auto oriented things relocating down there. They didn't want any auto repair. They didn't want anything down down by the river. So that's why they split it at the railroad tracks and said only that part between the railroad tracks and, and River Street out to Pioneer Street, only that wedge of a piece would be shifted to Eastern Gateway. I'm curious for others' thoughts. I, I, I'm I, feeling pretty split about that myself, and but leaning towards not, like I, I we, we need more housing um, and is storage the best use of that space? And, uh, and I know that the net zero Montpelier plan is not our zoning, but I believe that that proposal had housing down there. And um, so, I and do you, have, oh, sorry. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, you yeah can, go ahead. Sorry. The, the main reason I wanted to come tonight was to talk about this. Now, the main thing I wanted to convey to you was that the planning commission was not enthusiastic about any of the solutions on the table. <laughs> and that may not come through. Um, we have like the suggestion that, that you have is was a four to one vote, but it was at least two or three of those votes were really mixed. Um, we we were also considering uh, so so we this is the split the parcel so that so that part of it is Eastern Gateway now. Uh, another solution we were thinking of was to for this neighborhood only, not all of the riverfront, but just for this neighborhood only to allow storage units and to kind of make a, a tweak to the zoning that way. But what that would do is possibly allow some other parcels in the neighborhood to feasibly have storage units too. So there were some members in the planning commission who were concerned about the disadvantage of that approach. I didn't, I didn't like all of the um, possible uses that would be opened up with the, with uh, 
the Eastern Gateway expanding, but I was at least happy that it, we weren't expanding it to the entirety of both of the parcels, that we were at least limiting how much Eastern Gateway. And of course, the third solution was do nothing. And considering almost all of the uses on the parcel right now are no longer allowed at all, not even as, you know, conditional uses, we felt a we felt like we needed to try to do something to work with the property owners, even though we also, most of us, I think, shared your vision that this is a great mixed use buffer between our downtown and the Eastern Gateway. And that's kind of what Riverfront currently is. So the do nothing from a long-term planning perspective is great, but we, we wanted to work with the landowners. So, um, that's the full background and what have how we dealt with this and we talked about this over the course of three meetings two of which were hearings and the, the first time we didn't have four votes for any solution so then we tried it again the next week and this one had four votes but uh again there was some voter remorse afterwards too so 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 i wanted to give that context to to our suggestion well thank you that's really helpful context um others thoughts on this or um, any other parts of the plan? Nobody, nobody wants to comment. Uh, Jack, go ahead. I'll just say that I think this is a, it's a good thing that we have this uh, informational meeting in advance of our hearings because uh, this seems like something where I'm going to be paying, paying a visit to that uh, area with an eye to what uh, the, what the zoning is just to get a better sense of how I feel about it. Yeah, uh, and I, I'll just um, say too, I mean, that's an area that would be uh, bike path now, or the shared use path extended basically through Savings Pasture. It makes it proximal, walkable, bikeable to downtown and you know that that for me sets it at a different place um than just being you know, auto oriented uh, potentially it has that possibility um which i really like um any other sorry i know i'm making it pretty fair but <laughs> um, I mean, other, I, uh, jay go ahead no i just want to agree with jack that um yeah this having this information now is incredibly helpful to give us some time to, I like you, Jack, I want to go out and walk, walk it and see it and try to understand the context and understanding the different zoning that's happening and the space that it's happening. And um, just to think about how we could manage it for the, for the long term, I think is, is going to be really helpful. So I appreciate not having to just be putting in a position to have to decide right now without having that, the time to be able to understand and, and see it and think about, um, uh, you know, you know, possible scenarios for what, you know, what the, path, the best path forward is. So thanks and um, look forward to doing that. Look forward to a further conversation around it. Connor, did I see a hand? No, okay. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Mike. Thanks for, and Kirby for, uh, helping us understand the context for all of this. And I guess we'll take this up again um, as a first potential reading. Is that how we would call it for the 26th? Technically, the um, under the, the charter doesn't actually talk about this. So we actually follow state law on the adoption of zoning. And so it's actually only requires one hearing, but you guys can have obviously as many hearings as you want. Um, it is already warned as a hearing for the 26th. Um, and for anyone who's listening, who's interested in, in uh, taking a look at things, these are all on the website. Uh, on, the, on the front page, down at the bottom, you'll see design review, public hearing, um, and the documents are all in there, including Pioneer Street is in that, um, is in that same file. So it'll have the, the maps of the two and it'll have the draft written changes for the design review and um, the, the rest. There's one for design review and then there's one for changing the rest of the zoning because we kind of have to incorporate it in. So there's some adjustments that happen as a result of that. So, um, and if anyone has questions, you can contact me, um, my email mmiller 
at montpelier-vt.org. If somebody has questions or comments, we can certainly have them. So, thank you. Uh, Don. Uh, Mike, just have a little concern that this is August, and I know it's a strange August, but people's mindset is still summer. So we're doing this. I don't feel comfortable just having one hearing in August. And likewise, do likely impacted property owners get notices of these kind of changes? So in the planning commission process, every member of the design review district and, and their hearing was in March. So their, their hearing predated COVID and then we kind of came to a crashing stop and had to hold things for a while. But every person in the design review district was sent a copy of the changes and a notice of the public hearing and uh, uh, informed about the process. Um, we did hear from a number of people. Um, a lot of the, a number of them supported it. Um, some of them uh, didn't, but we, we tried to reflect as many of the changes and comments that they had. Um, and uh, we had a second hearing uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so they actually, we, they actually, planning commission actually held two hearings um, because we just reached a point where these design review changes have been ready for um, six, eight months now. And we really felt they're, they're an improvement over what we have. And we really wanted to start to move them forward. So we, we did warn another hearing um, and, and then included the pioneer. And in the pioneer, we contacted um, the laser wash and, and the parcels there. Well, I, I appreciate that and definitely your comments and Kirby's comments being here. I haven't been paying attention to the Planning Commission, but I'll get back to you. So I'm better uh, aware of these things happening. I've lost track. Thank you. So yes, and you're allowed to, you know, um, for, for new members of the council, you're, you, you, you can have as many hearings as you want. In fact, when we did the zoning that was adopted in 2018, um, people who were on the council then remember you got to see me, I believe it was 22 times in 2017 to, for us to get that adopted. So we can, we can do this as long as you'd like. Yeah, those were the days. <laughs> those were the days. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, to be continued on that then, thank you again um, for helping us understand the background. Um, any other comments, questions, thoughts for, for these two? Okay. All right. Thanks again. Um, all right. Do uh, we are going to uh, move on to our COVID nineteen update? And for that, I assume we're turning it over to Cameron. Yeah. So um, you might have seen it's quite a long one this week because we haven't met as a full council since. Um, July. And so there's quite a few updates. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to skip stick to the highlights. Um, uh, obviously, in this time, the governor has made it mandatory to wear a mask starting August 1st. Uh, the state requires that masks are now worn in public spaces, indoors and outdoors, when social distancing is not possible. This order applies to everyone over the age of two, and he does have a few medical health exemptions. Um, this one is pretty important and I don't, we've tried to spread the word on this, but I think it's a really important one is that the state does have resources available um, funding wise to help renters, homeowners and landlords make up for lost payments in the face of COVID-19. Um, these programs uh, started in July, uh, July 13th, but are still available through ACCD. We have these links available on the Montpelier homepage if you click on the COVID-19 update button. Um, but we've also been trying to share that through social messaging. And so if you guys know of anyone who needs the assistance, those are programs that do exist. Um, the governor did extend the state of emergency until August 15th. Um, they did confirm that the school would be opening August 8th and that sports would be allowed and practices would be allowed starting August 8th for school children but they do have to wear masks while they're playing um there is also another line of funding available for folks if they do not have the ability um, to connect with internet lines in your house there are grants available to individuals to help you extend telecommunication lines to your home um, 
So that is through uh, Public Service Vermont. Um, so if you go to publicservice.vermont.gov, they do have a COVID-19 line extension to help people connect to the internet. The governor did um, extend the amount of folks who could be inside buildings um, for uh, our businesses downtown or other businesses that can now operate at 50% of approved occupancy. Um, they did also expand the eligibility for economic recovery grants for businesses. Now owner operators can apply as well if they couldn't before. So that is also through ACCD and can be found on their website. Um, they also announced funding for um, child care programs to offset pandemic related expenses and losses. That is through the Department of Children and Families. And then um, that really sums up the state updates, but um, the city updates really haven't changed too much. Our senior center has pulled back a little bit on our opening plans. Um, so we're, we're even slower now on our, uh, our opening plans for the senior center. So right now that includes opening the actual building to foot clinics only for a little bit. And we are offering outdoor and Zoom lunching together. So um, make sure to check out their website and their um, uh, weekly report on that. And then um, we have been continuing to talk to the CAN groups and Montpelier Mutual Aid. So that's still going. We still meet um, pretty frequently. And we have seen a pretty um, significant upswing in interactions with our social media about um, uh, COVID-19. And I think it has to do with our prioritizing sharing the state's campaign, uh, hashtag masks on BT. They have a lot of really great new graphics and are sharing a lot of the CDC videos that sort of explain to folks um, what's going on and what the newest updates are. So um, we feel pretty good about our communications right now. So that's a summary. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Donna, go ahead. It's it's not a question, but I <clears throat> I do appreciate you doing this in a summary form because we get it in our packet or, or sent directly from you. But for people listening, it's really good that they you highlight these things. So it's a little tedious, but I appreciate you doing it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Okay, well, thank you so much, Cameron. Um, and uh, so I think that is the end of our regular business, which is super exciting. Um, so on to council reports. I'm gonna go in the order we always go in. So I'm gonna start with Donna. Okay, well, again, I'm gonna go back to Cameron. She's been covering for Bill when he's out playing around on vacation, <laughs> but she's also really been helping committees who are starting to meet was setting up their Zoom meetings. And I've made her the queen of Zoom meetings, referring all committees to her, and I appreciate that you're doing that. And I wanna thank voters who turned out. We had nearly 3,000 voters, which John Odom says is high. He's gonna talk about it later probably uh, for a primary. But I was uh, got the job of cleaning the voting booths. And I put my cell phone in my pocket and I didn't start work until three, from three to seven. I did nearly 7,000 steps. That's almost three miles running around that little space. <laughs> I thought, okay, that's what we should, we should say, volunteer to work at the polls and exercise. <laughs> but it was really wonderful seeing people. They were all very positive uh, for voting. So that's, that's all I wanna say, thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Connor. All right, well, uh, again, big congrats to yourself, Mayor. Um, watch the beautiful Zoom ceremony on Facebook Live and uh, a warm welcome to the first gentleman of Montpelier, Zach, of course. So <laughs> glad to have him, as long as he doesn't run for city council or anything from district too. We're very happy to I'll have him. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, uh, a couple of thanks, yeah, I worked the day before the election and like Donna said, uh, uh, John did an amazing job. It was like I think it was like playing a different sport for most elections, uh, just given the given the number of mail-in ballots. And 
you know, I'm sure he violated some child labor laws with uh, Zane there, but <laughs> Zane was in every day just working his tail off and did, did a really good job. Uh, another thank you to our furloughed employees coming back. Um, we really appreciate all of your sacrifices, um, but also want to extend a thank you to the uh, employees left behind who were, uh, in, in many cases, doing multiple jobs there and just, just keeping the city afloat there. So very grateful for that. Um, last thing, and I, I would just speak for myself, I'm pretty close to being ready to meet in person if we could. Uh, start configuring the council chamber to make it safe and everything. I, I understand leading by example, um, but I think so much goes into this, these, these meetings where, you know, it really does help to look across from the other people and, you know, have a conversation and looking at a bunch of squares on the screen there. So I may be a bit old school on that, but would, would love that at some point in the near future transition back. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Jay. Um, yeah, just quickly, I'll, uh, uh, Connor, I've had similar thoughts about being back in, uh, back in chambers and thinking about how we could make that work, uh, make that work safely, um, and, and leading by example and beyond that, just thanking John and, and all the volunteers that I think, uh, given the unique challenges of yesterday, it went incredibly well. It's great to see Donna, um, Donna there just chasing right behind me right after I voted, cleaning up. It was great. Um, so thanks to, thanks to all of you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dan. Um, I'll echo the other counselors, um, sentiments on thanking and congratulating everyone. Um, the th three things that I, that I wanted to raise, um, in addition were, um, you know, the newspaper had an article about how the state of Vermont is going to extend its remote working through the end of the year. I think we as a city have to think about what impact that's going to have on us. Um, and if that gets extended into the long term and thinking about our planning and um, what we can do for our community, because that's going to have an impact on retail, on restaurants, on our tax base, um, if there aren't as many people coming in. Um, and I think we should put that on our radar, maybe not obviously next meeting, but I mean, just sort of in our, in our, on our screens. The second thing is, you know, obviously I think the, the public restroom idea, I would like to see that come up in the fall to have that conversation because I think it's, it's resonated and it's something we really should, you know, start to start to think about. There are no easy answers, but there's still, it, it clearly is of a import. And um, the other thing, and I, I feel these are all just putting things back on our on a radar screen, is the uh, Central Vermont Public Safety uh, Authority, and whether we are going to do an appointment to that or, you know, recruit somebody for that. And I know Donna, you're really involved in in, in that. And um, but it just seems like I, I think we've we've let that languish a little bit, and we should um, again put it back up on the radar screen as it were. That's all. Thanks, everyone. I, just to follow up on the public restroom thing, I think we have it on the agenda f for, is it the 9th? Or, okay. yeah, so just to note. Excellent. That. Then I'll take that off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, super. Uh, Jack. Wait, Donna, I didn't know your job was cleaning the voting booths. I just thought you were the bouncer. <laughs> um, I'll pass tonight. Uh, okay, uh, Lauren. Um, yeah, just, well, first of all, apologize. I was in and out with my video. I was having really bad internet um, tonight. So I think I caught most everything, but apologies for that. Um, just wanted to echo uh, appreciation to and um, you know, it was great to see so many volunteers out and community members making it happen and John and the team are working incredibly hard. So nice work and, and also uh, congratulations and appreciation for all the candidates who stepped up to run. It's not an easy thing to do. And so thank you to so many people willing to serve um, in our state. So thanks to everyone who, who ran for office yesterday. Well, um, and the only other thing that I was hoping to uh, bring back up for you know maybe conversation this fall as well was we started a conversation in kind of 
probably February or something about um, the PFAS issue in our um, is coming to our wastewater treatment facility. Really interesting conversation and kind of left with a bunch of lingering questions about monitoring and what we could do. And I would just love to revisit that, you know, when we can of, you know, what what's happening with that and what our options are to make sure that we're ensuring safe water in our city. And that's it. And congrats, Anne. Thanks. Um, all right. So I also want to uh, thank John and the whole uh, Sea Clerk staff for their great work uh, on the election and uh, their adaptability and uh, trying to make it work uh, in a strange time. Uh, and um, I'm also glad that folks brought up the desire to start meeting in person. That was also on my radar. Uh, so to that end, I wonder if we couldn't just do a little bit of measuring of how far away the chairs are from each other uh, and see if that is sufficient. Oh, it's not sufficient. Mm, okay. Um, even so, maybe there's a way. <laughs> we'll come up with some proposals. I, don't, I didn't mean to, to, to be negative in the back. No, that's okay. I'm happy to just have that immediate answer of like, no, it's not six feet. Um, but even just knowing that, like, if we go back, if we're in a different um, configuration, that is okay. Um, but if we do go back, I think one of the things that I would really like to continue is to have this kind of venue um, for interaction available to the public. Because there may still be people who themselves don't feel comfortable coming out in public and to, I mean, you know, even just thinking about the whole, like, population that couldn't to start with, you know, if they are uh, homebound for whatever reason, um, just being able to give them um, this kind of access, I think, is um, is incredibly valuable. So, um, hopefully there's a way to, I guess, I guess some, create some kind of a hybrid, uh, but then if someone wanted to participate if we're in if if we're in a, a in person session and someone is in this venue and wants to participate, someone would just need to be um, you know monitoring to make sure. Anyway, there's some logistics there, but hoping that we can um, navigate that to be able to meet in person. So that potentially could be as soon as the 26th. Um, how how are you all staff feeling about that possibility? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna hedge this a little bit because I we're gonna talk to the team tomorrow morning. But perhaps we could have a proposal for you on the 26th for how this would work. And if you thought that was fine, you could adopt that, and it'll be for subsequent meetings because you should probably adopt the rules of how it's gonna go. Uh, you know, maybe we could just have you know you sign up for either all online or all in class. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> you gotta choose. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, and actually, that's a, that's a fair question. Um, other folks who didn't talk about that, how are you feeling about the possibility of meeting in person? Well, I, yeah, I guess ahead. if we end up having to wear a mask, I'm not in favor of it. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. If we don't have enough to... Yeah, I find the mask very uh, limiting in, in reading and communicating with people more than this venue. That's where I was coming from, too. I would love to be back doing meetings in person. Um, if I'm in it, if we're all in a three or four hour meeting wearing masks, eh, it's hard to say that the payoff is worth it. Although I know the clerk's office for election yesterday had some of those clear uh, face shields, which I guess they're not supposed to be a substitute for a mask. They're supposed to wear both, but uh, okay well that's that's fair um so like well anyway things to things to talk about um but ho hopefully that's something that we can at least have some kind of a plan for for next time um and then we can have a more robust conversation around it um i think that would make some sense uh so that's we are also trying to devote most of the next meeting to policing stuff. Right. Fair enough. We'll do that. Maybe we'll do that at the end. 
unless I don't know unless you all are need more time with it for some reason um, or it seems like the kind of thing that's just going to take too long to discuss um, the only other thing that I have on my radar as well is uh, just thinking about how the state has their own health order right now to wear masks and we have our own health order to wear masks and so I just wanted to put that you know, raise that flag to see how people felt. Um, so in a sense, it's redundant, but it also may provide just sort of like a double layer of like, no, you really got to do it. Uh, like just politically speaking, it might be good to keep it. Um, but again, it is redundant. Is anyone interested in either in, in either repealing it or keeping it? Uh, uh, Lauren, then Jack, or, or Dan, sorry. Um, well, one thought is just, I mean, I could see the state one going away sooner than we might be comfortable. So keeping it just on the book so it's there and we could, you know, keep having the conversation, but um, that would at least mean we wouldn't have to repass a new one if it got repealed. We have control over when it ends then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, point. Just to be clear, to a point, we, ours is tied to the, the state of emergency, whereas the governor's overall order where he said he gave they gave guidance on masks and said towns and cities can have stricter requirements if they want so we adopted a stricter requirement now that now they have the statewide one but if the state if the state of emergency ends then our authority to have one ends and right now it's extended to august 15th saturday but i saturday so I'm it sure. could run out pretty soon Actually, and I bet he will. Oh, he usually announces that the Friday before, so or the Friday closest. So we'll probably find out Friday. Okay. Uh, Dan. Yeah, I, I'm just picking back on both of the comments. I I, I think it's it, it's fine to keep in place. Um, the state supersedes it, but. If the state goes away, as long as there's a uh, state of emergency still in place, it's we can then make that decision. Fair enough. Okay, thanks for um, that quick temperature check on that uh, their team. Um, all right, uh, John. You are on mute. Oh, man. There, how's that? Better? That's great. <laughs> uh, thanks for all the kind words. Uh, they really go to staff and the enormous amount of volunteers that we've been able to turn out over the last few weeks who've been very flexible, but really, I mean, all I do is run around freaking out that something terrible is about to happen, so everybody else does all the work, and it's great. So thank you all. Most of you all were there helping out at some point during the process, and it seemed to work, so. Great. I'm going to take a vacation now. Well deserved. Do we all get in November, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll see what November is going to look like. Um, it's supposed to be an all male election. It sounds like I'm saying all males. No, male oh, in. That's getting, that's getting banned. <laughs> uh, which will be a totally different thing altogether. I mean, we were finding our way this time because it was different than we'd ever had it. And no could be even stranger. So to see how it goes, I called most of how this one was going to go wrong. Um, <laughs> let's see if I can do better on November. Fair enough. Well, keep us posted as, as to how we can help. Um, all right, Bill. I've got a bunch of things. None of them are particularly long, but I do want to kind of tick through them. Um, first, I just wanted to publicly acknowledge the loss of Jessica Sanderson, our employee at um, the Senior Center. Uh, it's the first time in 15 years, maybe, that we've actually had a, an active city employee pass away while they were working. And I think the last one was Aaron Sanders, who was a dispatcher in the police department who passed away from cancer. Um, so Jessica's was much more sudden. So huge loss there. Great person, well liked at the senior center, and they're they're scrambling to fill that. So our thoughts go to her family and her coworkers. 
Uh, secondly, uh, glad that you adopted the street policy. We do have a new application that will probably be on your agenda next week or so for, uh, it's very similar to the one we had before for painting over Labor Day to painting Justice for All, same applicant. Uh, so that will be coming up. Um, so uh, there's that. I uh, wanted to talk quickly about those kind of things. Um, we had a meeting today, you know, realizing how much turnover we've had in key positions and how much we're going to have. We had a meeting today to start sharing knowledge about some of the big events that we had in Montpelier since most of them didn't happen this year. So the new chief, new you know, people uh, you know, don't know about Do Good Fest and July 3rd and all those things because they didn't occur. So we were transferring some of that knowledge and I just I just want to provide a heads up on two things. One, you know, as these events get bigger, um, the costs to the city get higher and we may want to think about whether we want to assess fees. We also need to think about just the resources that we have to provide the safety services. Uh, you know, I know on one hand there's a, a cost about defunding, uh, discussion of defunding public safety services, but we also, as we expand these things, we're really, um, you know, we don't want to get them too big that we can't cover. So I mentioned that, and I think in light of that, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a slight change in tone of some of our uh, civic civil disobedience activities. You know, we've always had a lot of protests. We've always had a lot of marches and those kind of things. Um, but, you know, just the last couple, we had on, on the mayor's wedding day, we had some pretty ugly confrontations on, on the state house lawn between the sort of group that was uh, demonstrating to support the police and people that came to counter counter protest and there were a lot of uh, tough conversations. Just last week, a group, you know, digging up the state house lawn to plant things. Uh, in that case, the Montpelier police didn't get involved, but nonetheless, um, you know, that was a little bit of a destruction of public property that we haven't seen. So, you know, we don't know what this means, but as times get tenser and these issues get bigger, I just put that out there that, that we may be seeing a, a, a new change of, you know, people aren't feeling that they're being heard, they may get more active. So just a concern. Uh, one more thing on public safety. We were a little bit curious about, you know, in talking about the, the downtown and, and the shops and the, the people, whether, whether that it had, what the, what the impact it had on our services. And, um, you know, one of the things we often see is that we, because we are, only 8,000 people and we serve all these people, we have, have calls. So we asked our public safety people, it was the simplest thing to do, to compare the last four years from, you know, Mar mid-March when the quarantines basically started till now, what their calls were. And, you know, on fire and ambulance calls are exactly the same as they've been the last four years, even with the lower traffic and everything else. Police was down, but down from about, a little over 4,000 a year to a little over 3,000 a year. So yes, you know, they're down 25%, but there's still, that's still a lot of activity in that time period. So um, it, it was surprising to me how much, you know, how many calls and things were still going on, given the fact that, you know, we don't, haven't had shoplifting, we haven't had people downtown, we haven't had, you know, people falling on sidewalks and getting hurt, needing an ambulance and all those things that drive our services. So just, um, it's good to know that we're still an active community uh, and that we need these services well, even, even now. Um, just also want to note uh, that last Thursday was Jasmine Lamb's last day. So she's, I think, somewhere in Canada right now on her way to Alaska, um, last we knew. Uh, so we are down um, to keep, you know, that person in our office. So Cameron and I, and actually Jasmine Benson has just come back to work from her maternity leave in uh, public work. So she's going to help us out a little bit, but just be patient. We may, we may have a few drops uh, along the way. Um, on the good news is with the deadline for applications is Monday. We already have 90 applications for that position. Uh, in, in total, last, when we hired Jasmine, we had 25 just as a comparison. So uh, certainly a different labor market now, um, that's for sure. So we're obviously looking forward to getting somebody great new. 
but if you know someone who's interested, there's still time to just get tough competition. We'd love, we'd love to hear from them. So um, that's all I have. Can I jump back in? There's three. Yes. No. It's my time. <laughs> but uh, March Power passed away recently. Thank you. Um, very um, unexpected, I think. I didn't hear about it. I mean, those who were closer to her knew that she'd been very ill, but it happened relatively quickly. And Marge, you know, she's, um, she's a former city councilor. She's been so active in the community for so long and so active in the state. She was one of, has been one of, you know, a justice of the peace for years and is certainly one of the, was one of the most active and dependable uh, JPs that I've ever worked with. So, you know, a lot of us were really, really crushed to hear that. And um, so I just wanted to make sure uh, I mentioned so many, because so many folks in the community knew her and appreciated her. Yeah, thank you. Mar March had one black mark on her record, which was that she was on the city council that hired me. But other than that, she had a long distinguished career in public service. Um, and I would be remiss, and I, you know, I try to keep it, my comments just to Jessica, who's an active employee, but we, I should note, since we're doing this, uh, Sheila Pembroke's passing too. Sheila was a longtime uh, clerical person at the fire department handle all our ambulance building and had a, a lot of physical disabilities and issues the whole time she worked and always showed up, never complained, um, got the job done, kept those guys in order over there. And, uh, you know, as, as they noted, was the first female employee at the fire department. Still, there are none now except for Chris Hepburn and part time, but we have had. EMTs and firefighters, female firefighters since um, So it's a loss and obviously um, part of the, the large Pembroke family are married into the large Pembroke family here. So don't want to forget Sheila either. Thank you. Yeah, please uh, pass along our condolences to um, all those families. Um, all right. Well, thanks everybody. And, um, hopefully we'll be seeing you in person in a couple meetings. Maybe we'll see. All right. Thanks everybody. See you later. 955, 956. All right. <laughs> Close. Yeah.